gonna ask a question and I know all you weebs are gonna have an answer. What's your favorite anime bath scene of all time? Surely you have one, everyone does, right? See me, I gotta think all the way back to 1994. Street Fighter 2, the anime. First off, it blew my mind that there even was a Street Fighter 2 Japanimation cartoon. An actually well done one, not like that terrible American Street Fighter cartoon. <laughs> it looks more like dancing than street fight. Maybe a topic for another video, it's so bad. But not only was the Japanese Street Fighter 2 of a higher quality, it also had the same thing that got me to watch with the advisement of TV Guide, movies like The Dentist and Strange Days, which actually was a really good sci-fi film ahead of its time and somewhat prophetic. But that's besides the point, because the thing that got me to watch those movies, and Street Fighter 2 the anime, was boobies. Chun-Li in the shower all muscled up and wet. Watching those boobies. Truly an all-time classic. But this scene is but one of many documented throughout the great storied history of Japanese animation. And you can see them all on a little something called the Anime Bath Scene Wiki. Which for years has been curated by a single person with a laser focus on this very specific type of anime scene. What happens when this person's life's work winds up embarrassing the members of r slash anime in front of the rest of reddit on r slash all? Find out in today's episode of Tales from the Internet. This video is sponsored by Helix. Helix makes premium mattresses and bedding, custom fit to your needs and shipped right to your door. I've had my Helix mattress now for about a year and it's some of the best sleep I've ever had. When I had first gotten my Helix mattress, I had been complaining about neck pain and back pain and since I've been on it, it is yet to return. It's really easy to get a Helix mattress of your own. You just take their sleep quiz which helps determine what mattress is right for you based on your preferences and sleeping style. Since I'm a side sleeper who likes a soft mattress, they gave me the sunset. And if you're nervous about buying a mattress from the internet, Helix gives you a 100 nights of sleep trial. That's more than three months. And if you don't like the mattress, they'll pick it up right from your door and they'll issue a full refund. If you do like it, each Helix mattress has a 10 year warranty. And you don't have to spend a lot of money right up front with Helix's financing and payment plans. Just click the link below or go to helixsleep.com slash wang. You'll get up to $200 off your Helix sleep mattress as well as two free pillows. A lot of the world's knowledge is built on the backs of people who've dedicated their lives to a singular focus. In ancient times, you've had a guy whose mission was something like write down every type of bird. You'd have someone like Gregor Mendel dedicating his life to the inherited traits of pea pods. But by now, we basically know all the birds. We know what pea pods do. So then what's left for someone whose brain is wired that way, a modern day Gregor Mendel, but to document every single bathing scene that has ever been in an anime? Enter the Anime Bath Scene Wiki. Welcome to the Anime Bath Scene Wiki. 4046 articles and growing. The Anime Bath Scene Wiki is a collective database archiving bathing scenes from anime, manga, and other related media and showing the various elements involving them. We will contain spoilers on the material covered. Please also note, this is not a pornographic site, and even though there may be suggestive content, it is not the main focus or intent. Now, this is a pretty extensive database. Basically, any anime I could think of was represented on the wiki with an article about all of its bathing scenes. For the sake of this video, let's just take a look at Inuyasha, which has several baths throughout the manga, anime, movies, and even the trading card game. And you can take an even closer look on articles written about baths taken by specific characters. Let's go with Kagome. In her article, we can see a profile card that contains how many baths she's taken, where she's taken them, who she's taken them with, and what accessories she used while bathing. Shampoo and towel. Seems reasonable. Oh, and we can click on shampoo and see every single time there's been shampoo in a bathing scene in an anime. And as the article points out, this isn't to be confused with the character shampoo from the anime Ranma One Half. See also, soap, shampoo hat, females who have had shampoo in their hair, males who have had shampoo in their hair. Going back to Kagome's article, not only is every single bath occurrence in the series documented, but it also contains a description, dialogue, and trivia about the bathing scene. What kind of trivia could a bathing scene possibly have? Let's take a look. This is the only time in the series where Kagome takes a cold bath. Also, the only time where Kagome swims underwater. 
Kagome's mention of hot baths not existing yet gets contradicted later on in the series as she finds hot springs to bathe in as well as other forms of hot baths. This is the only time in the series where Kagome, or anyone, has bathed twice in the same episode. There is an error during the second bath scene. Kagome is seen soaking in the bathtub first, then washing outside the bath second, which is wrong since during a typical Japanese bath, they wash outside the bath first and get in the tub second. Hope someone got fired over that blunder. I could go through the wiki and do this with just about any anime you can think of to the point where I almost want to do an Angel Fire Adventures type stream for this, but that would be such a minefield that it would almost guarantee I get banned from Twitch. Clearly, this is not just the case of a person sitting down and watching all the episodes and writing down the bath scenes as they come, but rather a person who throughout the years has accumulated an encyclopedic knowledge of every bathing scene in every anime. To the point where they could just mentally cross-check these scenes for inconsistencies. And I know what you're thinking. What if you don't want to look at the anime bath scenes for the sake of a single character or a single series? You want to go back in time to a specific era for the nostalgia of the bath scene. You want to relive a moment in time. Well, not only does the anime bath scene wiki greet you every time you visit it, with a list of all the anime bath scenes that debuted this day several years ago, but it also allows you to view the bath scenes by year. Let's go back to 1993, a great year for anime titties. We got the likes of Ninja Scroll, Fatal Fury 2, and the continuation of Tenshi Muya. Oh, and we also get a few things that have nothing to do with anime or just more general bath scenes, like Ivo Robotnik has a bath scene in Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog episode 40. Lois and Clark, The New Adventures of Superman, Episode 11. Lois Lane takes a bubble bath in a honeymoon suite. And in fact, this site is a smaller part of a network of sites that documents all different kinds of baths, including the now-deleted video game bathing wiki and the anime Clawfoot Tubs blog, which specializes even more specifically in anime bathing scenes with just Clawfoot Tubs. So what kind of person possesses such encyclopedic knowledge of anime bath scenes, and how does such a project come to be? Introducing the wiki's owner and sole editor, Watermaiden15, aka Clawfoot Queen. According to her personal page on the wiki, they grew up watching anime in the 90s, where they noticed that almost every single anime had at least one bath scene. So, they started documenting them on a free website that they eventually lost the password to, before finding the wiki was the perfect site for this sort of project. Eventually, their blogger account was deleted, losing a lot of their content that wasn't on the wiki, and then, Wikia also deleted the wiki for being a fetish wiki, forcing them to fund the current wiki out of pocket. But is this actually a fetish wiki? In my opinion, I wouldn't consider it a fetish wiki since most of the site is focused not on any sexual aspects of the baths, but simply on cataloging them all and describing their circumstances. But after the wiki started getting more attention, Watermaiden15 had an AMA on their subreddit r slash anime baths. And someone asked about the fetish thing. Would you describe your love of baths as a fetish or a hobby? Both. The act of bathing is a beautiful thing to watch, and pretty much a work of art. They were also asked why they were specifically interested in clawfoot bathtubs. Clawfoot bathtubs are very appealing because of their unique design and comfortable shape. The four legs elevate the tub so it feels more like you're sitting in a chair or couch, rather than built-in tubs which make you feel like you're sitting on the floor. It has a very elegant design, and because they aren't too common in Japanese media, it is a huge excitement to see them acknowledged in anime and manga. How do you do it? Do you have a system? I have a folder filled with many other folders, each by a series name that contains all bathing related images and info in them. I have a 2015 folder which holds all recent bathing scene images, which is a to-do list of what to put up. Once they are put up, they go into the main archive folder under their series name. They are tons of caps I still haven't uploaded yet. My screen cap folder is around 20 gigabytes. Other revelations from the AMA include the fact that they maintain a day job while doing this and going to school, and in addition, they don't actually take baths that often. Instead, they choose the shower because they'd rather keep the baths for special occasions. Although admittedly, if they had a clawfoot tub, they would be taking baths in that tub every day. This AMA, however, was far from Watermaiden's most famous Reddit moment. 
That honor would be reserved for a post made on January 1st of 2015. Ringing in the new year with the top 10 anime bathing scenes of 2014. This post would become famous not just for how out of left field the topic was, but also because of the elaborate descriptions of each of these bathing scenes. Some of them were so over the top that people just assumed this was satire. I'm not going to read them all to you, but here are some choice award speeches. JoJo's Bizarre Adventure manages to make it high up on the bathing scene ranking for another year as Lisa Lisa's bathtub scene easily made it to the top of 2013's bath scenes. In this scene, Anne runs off by herself on an abandoned ship and decides to take a shower. The scene was very brief and quick in the manga, but the anime improved this scene in every way like they have done with previous scenes. The shower poses Anna does in the anime are drawn perfectly, making this finely crafted fan service, while the danger felt when she is cornered by the ape known as Forver. This version of the scene was easily better than the source material. After a universally hated second season, Infinite Stratos pulled out a nice OVA this year and easily spawned the greatest bath scene in the franchise so far. Here we see Cecilia Alcott, in a virtual fantasy world where Ishka is her servant and has him bathe her. It's great to see that she has great taste in bathtubs, as the tub she has in her mansion is a nice clawfoot slipper bathtub, a type of tub that anime can never have enough of, and surprisingly doesn't appear as much in anime as one might think. The highlight of the scene is when she stands up in the tub and Ishka watches her body. An amazing shot of the bathroom and bathtub shape is shown when he starts to wash her butt and grabs onto it. While Suicide no Gargantia is an extremely beautiful series, the biggest disappointment about it was the lack of any bath scenes. The problem was fixed in the new OVA sequel that has everyone in the baths of the Gargantia. Despite the bath looking very dirty, this anime manages to make that grime look great. The fan service is fantastic in this scene, as many firmly drawn buttocks of the random females appear in the background under showers and washing themselves. The highlight of this scene that truly captivates its beauty is when Bellows is seen lifting her leg up and getting into the bath. No matter what, that is always a fantastic action that more animes need to capture. There's a struggle that anime fans often have to contend with. The most self-aware members of the community recognize that other people, people who aren't anime fans, generally see the anime subculture as being full of degenerate weirdos. And as much as a lot of these anime fans would like to show these people some of the fantastic works of art that have been put out throughout the years, this kind of stuff just tends to bubble to the surface. The top voted post put it best. We should upvote this to the top of r slash all so people think we're even weirder. And that's exactly what happened. r slash all reporting in, what the fuck is wrong with you people? The arrival of r slash all prompted all kinds of discourse between the anime fans and the non-anime fans. For example, a number of people were uncomfortable with the fact that many of the award winning scenes involved underage characters. Or that one of them involved an incestuous rape scene. And of course, there's the fact that many of the people commenting on the post were discovering for the first time, as many of you are right now, that there exists a massive wiki dedicated entirely to just anime bath scenes. So the r slash all people are coming in like, hey, is this what you people do all day? To which they'd have to point out, no, just the one person. A top 10 of lettuces would be nice too. Lettuce is really more of a western thing, so I'm going to assume you meant cabbages. In which case, it's been done. Cabbages in anime can be used to measure the quality of the art. Looking at that post, I actually do think there is some validity to this. There are also those who wanted to debate the contents of the list, including a number of posts where people felt that their favorite series were snubbed. To which Water Maiden responded, Trinity 7 had good bathing scenes, but nothing spectacular enough to stand out. Prisma Ilya 2 way almost made it, and I personally didn't find any of Blade Dance's scenes that great, and was disappointed with what little bathing scenes it put out. Some of the members of r slash anime lamented that this post was part of a larger decline of the subreddit. They noted an increase in not safe for work content and felt that it was causing the subreddit as a whole to just get worse. 
Some people were taking issue with that and suggested splintering off the subreddit into other NSFW ones, while others thought that kind of content was fine. And ultimately, it became part of commonly repeated Reddit lore that it was this thread that got r slash anime banned from r slash all. And it is true that the subreddit stopped appearing on r slash all around this time. However, it would be revealed by mods a month later this wasn't actually the case. Missy Pie, is it true that the best bath scene of 2014 thread got us banned from r slash all? Is that even possible? And if so, is r slash anime banned? Or did the mod team remove r slash anime? This rumor has been going around for a while and there was never any public statement on this issue. It wasn't that particular thread, but yes, we're removed, not banned. We chose to remove r slash anime because of the constant linking to subreddit drama we were getting. I don't know what that face is. So rather than continually being the laughing stock of Reddit, r slash anime simply opted to hide in the darkness, at least as much as such a large subreddit can. The real test would come several months later when Water Maiden starts taking nominees for the best bathing scenes of 2015, a post which eventually gets taken down by a mod. This has been removed for now. We're discussing whether or not we want this year. You caused a huge shitstorm and the headache for us last time with something similar to this, and we're unsure if we want that same headache this time around. The comment by the mod was downvoted and the other users argued that now that r slash anime was taken out of r slash all, you wouldn't have the same problem. So finally, the new year comes and Water Maiden posts the new list. It was removed almost immediately. But not necessarily because of the infamy of the bathing thread, but rather in the time since r slash anime had gotten stricter about NSFW content. It was allowed to be reposted by a user named the Britian only after they went through and censored every single image. And once again, this was a massively upvoted post and much of the same discourse happened in the thread. People bothered by the idea, people who thought it was funny, people who had their favorite scenes that they felt should have been included, but it just didn't match the shit show of the year before. And without the judging eyes of the rest of Reddit, how could it? As the top voted comment put it, I mean... The mods can't remove this from r slash all twice, and in the years following, the list would not get posted to r slash anime. Instead, Water Maiden opted to post it to their own Anime Bath subreddit. And to this day, the Anime Bath scenes wiki continues to be expanded on, each day boggling the minds of the people who are learning for the first time that it exists. I remember my first time. I had been flirting on and off with this girl for years, then one day I wake up to a text on my Nokia brick phone it said, you want to get busy? I was over there so fast, you wouldn't even believe, pounding it out with Crazy Town playing in the background. I would think about all these shows I used to watch that built up virginity to be on this pedestal, and I thought, man, that was very unceremonious of me in comparison. On the flip side of that, you have what happened in July of 1998. That was when two 18-year-olds named Mike and Diane declared their intent to lose their virginity on the internet in a live stream. This is the story of OurFirstTime.com. This video took me places that I never imagined it was going to. You know, I thought it was just going to be a quick overview of this quirky old website, and it led me down this rabbit hole of complete insanity. It begins in July of 1998 with a website called OurFirstTime.com. The site told the story of two recently graduated 18-year-old honor students named Mike and Diane. And on the 8th of August, they were going to do a live stream of them losing their virginities. Note that it wasn't Mike or Diane themselves speaking to us, the audience. Instead, the entire website was presented from the perspective of an older gentleman named Oscar. Oscar was a web designer who was guiding them through this process. My name is Oscar, and I'll explain what brought this event to where it is now. Right now, you're probably in a state of shock, disbelief, and utter outrage. That is to be expected. The shattering of taboos can easily shake the pillars of society. Recently, I watched the live birth of a baby on the internet. Later, I wound up in a chat room where the topic was about the live birth. As expected, there are arguments and opinions from every corner of the country. There was one young woman named Diane who made a comment that caught my attention. She said that she thought the live birth was a wonderful and amazing experience. The only problem that she has is that 
Most people think the live birth was beautiful, but if a couple were shown live on the internet in the act of conceiving a child, then most people would call that obscene. She finished by saying, if I could, I would lose my virginity live on the internet, just to show that the act of conceiving a child is just as beautiful as the delivery. I contacted Diane by email and introduced myself. Totally normal thing to do. I'm a website developer and I asked her if she was serious about letting the world watch as she loses her virginity. I met with Diane and her boyfriend Mike, also a virgin, and we discussed this radical idea. After two weeks, Diane and Mike decided that this is something they feel passionate about and have agreed to allow the world to follow them for the next 18 days. Every day on this website, their lives will be chronicled in pictures and text as they climb the pinnacle of self-expression and make their worldwide statement of love when they consummate their relationship on the internet. Over the next 18 days, the older gentleman Oscar would join the two teens and interview them while taking pictures. When you took your AIDS test, you were both a little nervous. How did you feel today getting your results? Ah! It was also very much a product of its time. It's bad enough that I had to try and explain to my 10-year-old son what oral sex is because of the Monica Lewinsky stuff. What do you expect me to tell him about what you are doing? The truth. If you weren't around then, it cannot be understated how big of a deal the Monica Lewinsky Bill Clinton scandal was. But anyway, let me get this straight. You got an older feller from a chat room online watching a live baby birth, hitting up an 18 year old girl from the same chat room and asking her if she wants to lose her virginity on a live stream. In 1998, decades before OnlyFans. Seems legit. And just look at these 18 year olds. These 18 year olds are the most 18 years old any 18 year olds have ever been. Nothing suspicious at all. And now, when I tell you about a website where two people are intending to lose their virginity on a stream, you're thinking it's probably a porn thing, right? Well, the site's creator didn't see it that way. OurFirstTime.com presented itself as an educational, safe sex experience for teens. This was an angle that was almost immediately mocked by a parody site, OurFirstAnalSex.com. Thanks for coming to OurFirstAnalSex.com for the story of Diane and Mike. People from around the globe, connected by a network of cables and satellites and phone lines, all have access to this site, and the connectivity is the power of the internet, blah blah blah. Anal sex is not dangerous if performed properly. Diane and Mike are played by trained professionals, and will be performing with a full staff of healthcare providers on site. We do not recommend that you try ass-pounding yourself unless you are properly trained. You are a healthcare provider, your partner is a healthcare provider, or your partner is deceased or imaginary. We do recommend, before having sex with someone for the first time, that you get really drunk. This will make them seem more attractive. If that doesn't work, try a mild hallucinogen, although this may interfere with sexual performance even more than alcohol does. Above all, have fun. Even if someone gets hurt, try to be certain it isn't you. Despite all the mockery and the very suspicious setup, the site gained a lot of attention almost immediately through both word of mouth and mainstream media coverage. So much so that the servers couldn't handle it and OurFirstTime.com was in search of better hosting. However, it was only porn hosts that were vying to help with the project and they really weren't interested in doing anything with the porn industry. You know, despite offering a live sex cam, their lawyer, identified as Mark Vega, spoke to Reuters. This is not television or voyeurism, this is about participating in the dialogue. So stop listening to your minister, or preacher, or pope, or your boss, government, or regular, and take a step in the privacy of your own home, on your computer, and register your opinion, Vega told Reuters. Ultimately though, the clock was ticking and they had to get something together while people were still paying attention. They realized that they would have to compromise a little bit if they wanted to save the project. Enter the Internet Entertainment Group. The Internet Entertainment Group was the Internet's first major pornography company. You probably remember them as the company that distributed the Pamela Anderson and Tommy Lee sex tape. 
It was created by a man named Seth Warshawski, who had built the company with money he made in the phone sex industry. He was a major pioneer in this industry, creating the first website with live cam girls. This put him in the unique position to provide the website with the exact resources they needed. However, what seemed like a perfect match at first wound up being the project's undoing. Not long after the arrangements were made, IEA made a scathing post to their main website, clublove.com. In the post, they reveal our first time to be a scam. IEG can exclusively report that those behind ourfirsttime.com had attempted to mastermind a plot to not only manipulate the worldwide media, mislead the public, steal millions of dollars in site admission fees from the pockets of hard-working viewers around the globe, but in their own words. In tribute to Orson Welles and the 60th anniversary, this worldwide hoax will be bigger than his War of the Worlds as we tell the world we will consummate our relationship at 8pm sharp the same time War first began to play on the radio back in 1938. On their website, the alleged virgins answered the repeated question, is it real, with the word yes. However, as smart as selecting IEG was for Mike and Diane, it would also lead to their fall from grace. As the mastermind behind this massive media hoax dreamed of sitting on a white sandy beach, sucking down a drink with an umbrella in it, thinking about the estimated $5 million in revenue to be generated and reading about his scam on the cover of Time magazine. IEG had their staff not only looking into how to resurrect the most beautiful site for these lovebirds, but also to look into the authenticity of the event. Soon, the man who called himself Oscar Wells checked into a $144 a night room with a double bed at Holiday Inn in Glendale, California with a woman called Lydia Rawlings. After IEG exposed them, they fled the hotel room without checking out was having his intentions dissected in a swank high-tech conference room in Seattle, IEG headquarters. It was here, last night, that IEG officials discovered the truth behind Mike and Diane, a truth that not only horrified them, but angered them for what is nothing less than an assault on society and those who relish the internet. And for no other reason than to create havoc, those behind the hoax directed their site to Disney.com. IEG has provided Disney executives with this information. Who is Oscar Wells? The man who bragged to family and friends he'd go down in history alongside Orson Wells. His name is Kenneth Tipton. Tipton was once indicted on obscenity violations for selling videos such as Hail Mary. And one note before moving on with this, my research shows that the movie was actually the last temptation of Christ. His legal defense cost him everything he had and to this day, blames the religious right for what he claims was an overzealous criminal prosecution. For simplification, we will refer to them as they deservingly do, the scammers. As the post went on, Seth laid out how the event was intended to play out. But here's what Mr. Tipton, or the scammers, exclusively told IEG was really planned for the site. On a daily basis, they would keep the viewers updated. The couple would pretend to intend to lose their virginity. They would go get AIDS tests. The couple would discuss how excited they were. On the big day, the day the couple claimed they would lose their virginity, the website would no longer be free. The website would cost $5 per person. Then, when the moment comes to do the deed in front of the audience paying 5 bucks a connection, the couple would abstain. Nobody has any intention of having sex, said Tipton. You won't even see them naked. Christ, I wouldn't be surprised to find out Diane lost her virginity years ago in the back seat of a Chevy. Mr. Tipton said that he and the scammers who worked with them pulled this ploy for two basic reasons. One, to make money, and two, to get back at the religious right. Surely, this was the end of our first time.com, right? Well, a week later, Ken Tipton, having now dropped the moniker of Oscar Wells, starts speaking to the press. He denies that the website is a hoax, and now says that it will be hosted by Condomania.com. Condomania being a condom store chain. He also announced that there would be a press conference for the event held at Condomania's LA store. The press conference happened, and it did not go well. As he sat uncomfortably in front of a wall of various styles of condoms, Ken announced that the website was indeed a hoax. 
Or as he put it to the audience of pissed off reporters who are now yelling at him, an internet soap opera. Mike and Diane were revealed to be Ty Taylor, an actor who had just moved to LA and been working as an extra, and Michelle Parma, an actress who was previously in a season of Road Rules on MTV. And they maintained throughout the whole press conference that this was intended to be educational. This was about making a moral lesson, Taylor said. It was going to be the biggest public service announcement ever, Parma said with feeling, adding that if the event had taken place, it would have been about safe sex and abstinence. Reporters listened incredulously as the red-haired Parma explained, You have to hit young people over the head. Public service announcements say, do this, don't do that, wear condoms. But it doesn't seek in because the kids can't relate to them. We are going to relate to young people. How do I reach these geeks? Obviously, the stream never actually happened, and after the press conference, the script for the final day was posted. Allow me to read an excerpt from this masterpiece. Mike. Are you ready to choose which condom? He holds out his bald fist. Diane holds out hers. Diane, ready. One, two, three. Diane displays a flat palm, signifying paper. Mike displays a bald fist, signifying rock. Mike, okay, you won. You choose. Diane, I think we'll use your condom. All right, not too outlandish yet. This is how the process usually goes. Mike picks up a packet off the end table near the bed. He starts to tear it open, but has difficulty. Diane, did you read the directions? Mike squints at the package. Mike, I'm nervous enough. I can't read writing the size of mouse tracks. Diane takes the packet from him and opens it quickly, pulls out the condom and hands it to him. He shrugs, slightly embarrassed. Diane, it's a girl thing. You can still open a jar of pickles better than I can. They wound up ruining that condom and trying to use the other one before deciding, you know what, fuck it, let's not do this. After they decide not to go through with it, the camera pans to a chair in the same room where Oscar's sitting with them. He then gives a monologue on the importance of Orson Welles and the power of the internet. End scene. You'll be happy to know, though, that in a parallel world, the couple from our first analsex.com did go through with it. It's all over. On August 11th, 1998, at approximately 5.15 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time, Diane had her rectum penetrated by Mike, and thus, they both lost their anal virginity. It was very rewarding for both of them, and they might even try it again in the near future. The transcript of the event will be available in a matter of days, so be sure to return then. Shortly after this all fell apart, Ken Tipton decided to take Seth Warshawski to court for defamation. It took a couple of years for them to actually see trial, and when it happened, the case was dismissed. Ken was given another chance due to appeal, but that too was dismissed, and this time, Seth Warshawski had fled the country. Owing a massive settlement to Pamela Anderson and Tommy Lee, he just bailed to Thailand. In an interview, he explained that he had enough money left to live 50 comfortable lives over there. And I thought originally this would be where the video ended, but it is definitely not. I was looking at the Museum of Hoaxes article about this topic when I noticed a single comment. It was left by someone named Darlene Lieblick. In the comments, she asserted that the article was wrong about this story, and she attached a link to what she said was the true story. That link went to the website for the movie Heart of the Beholder. Heart of the Beholder was a 2005 film written and directed by none other than Ken Tipton himself. It's probably most notable for being one of the first acting roles of Chloe Moretz. And it tells the story of a video store owner who runs into a conflict with a conservative religious group over a controversial movie. In other words, a fictional retelling of what actually happened to Ken Tipton in real life. Although the site was mostly about the movie itself, there were two memorial pages. One of them for the director Robert Wise, who mentored Ken Tipton, and one for Michelle Parma, the actress for Diane, who since then had passed away in a car accident. The Robert Wise memorial page tells of how Heart of the Beholder came to be. Originally, Heart of the Beholder was going to be produced for HBO, but they dropped the project. It was Robert Wise who pushed Tipton to make the movie himself. Encouraging him to do over 200 script rewrites, he finally had a finished product. So Ken starts shopping the screenplay around, and he's getting some offers, but they're only writing offers, and they wouldn't allow him to direct the movie. And he didn't want that because he was concerned that if another director ruined the movie, it would be bad for his career. So he turned all those offers down, and at a loss, he consults Wise one more time. Things back in St. Louis were very hard for Ken's ex-wife and their children, so Ken asked Mr. Wise for advice. 
Mr. Wise said that this situation reminded him of his old friend named Orson Welles. In the 1930s, Orson was a star on radio, which was the largest mass medium at the time. TV had not been invented yet, and movies were still growing. Orson wanted desperately to make movies, but the powers that be thought of him as only a radio person and not talented or creative enough to make it in the movies. So Orson decided to create a publicity stunt to prove them wrong. It was Wise's suggestion that Tipton take after Orson Welles and create his own publicity stunt. Taking Mr. Wise's advice to design a publicity stunt to bring attention to his movie project, Ken first decided to use the internet because it was the newest form of mass communication and it reached the entire world. The hardest part was coming up with an idea that would be instantly popular and controversial so the content would spread quickly because of reactions to it. Invaders from space had already been done and there isn't much else you can get from millions of people talking, except sex. Yes, sex. The bane of conservatives and the delight of liberals. After all, this was 1998, and the Monica Lewinsky slash President Clinton sex scandal was going absolutely bananas. Like I said, this was a really big deal at the time. Every possible sexual allegation and innuendo was being dissected daily in every form of media. Ken knew if he could come up with some original sexual internet soap opera, then the conservatives would fire up their email lists and the liberals would rise to defend it, which would create its own publicity. But, try as he could, no plausible story idea would come to him. But, that was about to change and become the world's largest publicity stunt ever. And it's on the memorial page for Michelle that they go further in depth about the publicity stunt itself. In fact, the Michelle Parma memorial page contains relatively little information about Michelle herself, and is mostly pages upon pages explaining the publicity stunt and the war with Seth Warshawski. This is an absolutely massive page, so I'm going to do my best to break it down for you. Originally, it was intended that after the publicity stunt, Mike and Diane, Ty, and Michelle would go on to star in Heart of the Beholder using publicity from the stunt to promote the movie. It was asserted that it was never intended to deceive the reporters and they should have known it was a hoax. The reason why they should have known it was a hoax is because they put phrases in quotation marks such as church-going honor students and losing their internet virginity. Because, you know, that's how quotation marks work. It goes on to discuss the deal with IEG. According to the person that wrote this, the original deal was that IEG would provide the servers at first with no ads and no fees. After six months, IEG would retain the website and be able to do whatever they wanted with it. But after the massive traffic came in, Warshawski said, you know what, we should probably charge $5 for this to have an adult verification. Ken did not want the adult verification because he wanted kids and teenagers to see this vital safe sex lesson. It also tells how Adam Glickman, the owner of Condomania, told them that they could make money to fund the movie by collecting user data from registrations. Warshawski was also unhappy that he would not be getting money from the user data list. So ultimately he reneged on the deal and took the side away. And at this point, obviously one of these guys is lying. Either Warshawski cancelled the deal because he didn't want to be associated with a hoax, or he cancelled it because he wasn't making enough money on it. The page then goes on to explain that the event simply could not go on without the use of IEG's ultra supercomputer servers, and that if everything went as planned, the Our First brand could have been as big as Yahoo, Google, MySpace, YouTube, and it's also explained that Tipton did regret how he went about the stunt. He realized that the Oscar character was a really bad idea and he should have never spoken to reporters in character. To me, there's something interesting to think about with this, and it's that in a way, Ken was kind of onto something. He very badly miscalibrated his attempt, and he probably did it a few years too early, but I can't help but look at something like Lonely Girl 15, which happened eight years later. It wasn't as preposterous as this, but it was a hoax in the same vein. A dramatized fictional story that tricks people into thinking it's reality. And this still isn't where the story ends for Ken Tipton. You see, I was a little curious about what he'd been up to lately, and I could not believe what I found. You might remember the commenter from the Museum of Hoaxes, Darlene Lieblick, 
now Darlene Liebelich Tipton. Since then, she had become the vice president of Fox Cable Networks in LA. Then in 2014, this happens. Veteran Fox TV executive fired over fundraising campaign for relatives of missing Malaysia plane passengers. So for those unaware, Malaysia Flight 370 was a passenger plane that in 2004 just kinda vanished, totally missing along with its 239 occupants. To this day, nobody actually knows what happened to that plane. And at first, the reaction to this story was kinda favorable to Diane, I mean, to fire someone for raising money for a good cause, that's real scummy. But then, the nature of the actual email she sent came out. Around this time, a woman named Sarah Bosch, the girlfriend of one of the passengers, Philip Wood, had been making some press appearances to talk about the disappearance. Darlene reached out to Sarah from her Fox email to talk about a project with her husband, Ken. To the point, my producer slash partner slash husband, Ken, and I are working on a project that focuses on the compensation of family members of victims from Flight 370. We both saw your interview with Ronan Farrow and kept hoping he would ask if you were considered family because you were Philip's partner for nine years and whether or not you qualified for compensation by the airlines or any other kind of, sorry about this word but I can't think of any other, survivor's benefits. If you don't mind, I'm going to turn this over to Ken and he would like to ask you some questions by email or Skype. His email is above. The bottom line is that we want to help you get what you deserve as much as any other family member. Thanks, and I hope to be able to talk to you myself soon. Darlene Tipton, Vice President, Standards and Practices, Fox Cable Networks. Sarah thought this might have been some kind of a scam because it sounds like a scam and more emails came of growing intensity. Eventually, Darlene said that she knew what happened to the passengers on that flight and that her husband Ken was having prophetic visions of what happened to the flight. Ken's vision can be viewed on YouTube. <laughs> oh, this is this has got to be a, an illusion. It's this has got to be the this has got to be this has got to be the pills, the medicine. I am hallucinating. This is not real. I got a strange question to ask you. Is this real? Is this real? What's happening right now? It is. What is real? That's my problem. I don't know. I, I don't know if what I'm seeing. What are you seeing right now? I'm seeing. Ultimately, and you're going to be shocked by this one. The plan was for Ken and Darlene to make a movie about the Malaysian flight. It would be based on the contents of a secret thumb drive she became privy to at Fox. In March of 2014, 40-year-old Hollywood veteran Darlene Lieblich Tipton was a vice president of broadcast standards and practices at Fox Cable Networks in Los Angeles. S&P is the department responsible for the moral, ethical, and legal implications of what the network airs. During this time, Darlene was at a high-level meeting to discuss the contents of a smuggled Chinese thumb drive. The drive contained detailed information and previously unseen pictures, video footage, and text files regarding the disappearance of MH370, Malaysia Flight Number 370, after the plane had gone missing. The materials revealed who hijacked the plane, why, what went wrong, where it all ended, and why China has a lot to answer for. The movie would also show that the disappearance of the flight was connected to the Chinese government's harvesting of organs from Falun Gong prisoners, and it would be crowdfunded, providing commemorative coins as a reward. And their goal was to have it be directed by Martin Scorsese and feature a cast with actors such as Brad Pitt, Harrison Ford, and Lady Gaga. This movie was not made. And the last post on their crowdfunding website explains why. Update September 29th, 2019. Executive producer Darlene Lieblich Tipton went to Australia and New Zealand to negotiate the funding of the Malaysia 370 movie. On her return, she was stopped at LAX and questioned by agents of the US government. At the advice of her personal attorney, the Malaysia 370 project is now on an indefinite hold until national security issues can be resolved. All donations have been returned and further donations will not be accepted at this time. 
The downloading of songs and the purchase of the memorial coin will still be active. I think I gotta get my hands on one of those coins, you know, I mean, I like collecting little trophies that come from this channel. On August 24th, 1986, Paul Morgan's life was forever changed. He was in an accident which left him paralyzed. Paul and several of his friends had been out boating that day. They were on their way home, pulling the boat on a trailer behind the truck. Paul fell out of the back of the truck and was run over by the boat trailer they were towing. He spent three months in and out of hospitals. The injury has resulted in several back surgeries as well as having a kidney removed. Paul's lifestyle changed dramatically after the accident. After much pain and rehabilitation, he has regained limited walking ability with the help of leg braces. This was how Paul Morgan would describe the incident that would alter the course of his life forever. And here's the thing, this happened all the way back in 1986 and medical technology has progressed a lot since then. Although the doctors did what they could do at the time, Paul knew that modern procedures could drastically improve the quality of his life. But the thing about these new procedures is they would require an amputation that Paul's insurance provider didn't feel was necessary. But Paul was no quitter, he hatched a plan. Paul's plan was to crowdfund the removal of his feet and reward the donors with a live stream of the amputation of his feet using a homemade guillotine. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the story of CutOffMyFeet.com. The American healthcare system is a disaster. We pay way too much money to insurance companies, and when you actually need to use the insurance companies, they do everything they possibly can to make sure that you don't get what you paid for. And that's even if you have insurance, otherwise people seem to be increasingly turning to GoFundMe to have other people pay their medical bills. But GoFundMe has only even been around since 2010, and it's been much more recent that it became socially acceptable to use it in that way. But that doesn't mean that this whole thing started with them. Enter Paul Freck Morgan. In 2001, Paul created a website called CutOffMyFeet.com where he proposed his plan to cut off his feet. And although this sounds like this setup for some kind of uh, body integrity identity disorder based manga, this actually wasn't based on any kind of deep-seated compulsion that he had, rather some kind of medical necessity. He did it out of a very real medical concern that would improve the quality of his life. After the boating accident that I spoke about at the beginning of the video, Paul became paralyzed beneath his knees. Here's how he described the condition. Paul's accident partially severed the T12 in his spinal cord. This has resulted in partial paralysis from the waist down. Above the knees, Paul has working quadriceps, adductors, abductors, and medial hamstrings. The paralysis increases below the knees, leading to complete paralysis of the feet. He has feeling all the way to his ankles on the front side of his legs and a dull sensation on the back side of his legs. He has no feeling or movement below the ankles. A procedure was performed to salvage what they could of his movement but it didn't go perfectly. During the initial surgery, when the spinal injury occurred, which was two days after the accident, the thoracic 11 lumbar one were fused by Harrington rods. A year later, another surgery was needed to remove the Harrington rods. However, there was a piece of wire left in my back for no apparent reason. It showed up in the x-ray like a wire in a bread tie. There was also a piece of bone from my right pelvis used in the fusion of the T11 and T12L1 vertebrae. Paul was a bit unsatisfied with the results of his procedure, but there was little that he could do at the time. But the years would go by and medical technology would improve, and in 2001, Paul hatched a plan with his buddies to help improve his life. The idea. Paul Morgan is a man who desperately wants to lead a normal life again. When the accident first happened, the technology was not available for that to happen. While the technology is now available for Paul to lead a better life, the financial burden would be much more than he could afford. Since Paul is on Medicare slash Medicaid, his insurance will not cover the amputation and new prosthetics because it is not deemed a necessary procedure. Paul also receives medical disability, and his Medicare plan does not even cover the cost of his catheter bag. Paul doesn't want to fight a no-win battle with the insurance and medical communities in the United States. Paul is using this event as a chance to speak out against the lack of care 
in the medical field and the insurance industry. He strongly believes that this could make great strides in the much needed insurance and medical reform in the United States. This amputation is simply Paul's way of saying that even though corporate America has refused him, he will get his new prosthetics and improve his quality of life. Paul and his friend, Kevin Nicholson, came up with the idea to charge internet access and cut off Paul's feed on the internet. By charging a small fee for the webcam access, Paul will raise the money he needs for the operations, prosthetics, and rehabilitation. The stream was scheduled to go down on September 19th of 2001 and people could gain access by paying $20. And in addition to webcam access, they would also get exclusive updates from Paul as well as be entered in a contest to be able to see the amputation live and in person. The contest was won by Jared Pallone of Pompano Beach, Florida. Congratulations, Jared. And don't worry, after getting his feet cut off, Paul wasn't just gonna hop around on stumps and go, what are we gonna do now? He had a plan. A plan that was outlined in part in his FAQ section. Aren't you worried about losing too much blood or about bleeding to death? I plan on having medical professionals on location to stop the bleeding. We will also be using a Dr. Bovey machine to cauterize the legs. This is the same type of machine that is used in hospitals during amputations. What are you going to do with your feet after you cut them off? Would you consider an auction? I'm not sure if that's legal. In our initial planning, we had talked about purchasing human legs or a cadaver to test the blade of the guillotine. Unfortunately, it's illegal, a federal crime, to buy or sell bodies or body parts. So, since an auction is not an option, but I like the idea, I guess I'd like to have my legs frozen. Then maybe one day medical science will find a way to let me use them again. Are you insane? No, I am not insane. This is something that I thought through very carefully, but for all of you who still doubt, I plan to have a full psychiatric evaluation done to prove that I'm completely sane. Paul's website would spread mostly by word of mouth until that July when he called into the Howard Stern Show. Although I was unable to find a recording to the episode, essentially he just outlined the whole process, what his plan was, and mentioned that he would need $150,000 to make this all come true. And from that point on, the website exploded and this was amplified even further by mainstream media coverage. He even managed to pick up some classy new advertisers on his website. And thus, the construction of his homemade guillotine began. But all this attention would be a bit of a mixed blessing as shortly after his call into the Howard Stern show, he would receive contact from the Mississippi Attorney General's office. A spokeswoman for Mississippi Attorney General Mike Moore said state officials had been in touch with Morgan's lawyer about the matter. We have heard about this and we have contacted his attorney because we are concerned, said Nancy East, Moore's spokeswoman. East said the state had offered to have Morgan evaluated by a surgeon in Jackson, the state capital, if Morgan agreed not to go ahead with the amputation. East said the internet amputation could violate a number of state laws, including a mayhem statute and laws protecting consumers from fraud. But despite these legal concerns, Paul decided to go forward with his original plan. Albeit he did delay it to Halloween, and then November 30th, and then eventually January 5th. The biggest holdup being that he just wasn't making the money that he thought he was going to make. Despite the fact that his site was getting tens of thousands of visitors now, he only got about 20 people to sign up for the live stream. Not even enough to cover the cost of production, let alone all of his medical bills. And that's definitely a bit of a sign of the times. I mean, if you think about it, if this happened today, it would probably go viral instantly. If he set up a GoFundMe, he would probably reach that $150,000 goal instantly. And legal considerations aside, if the stream were to happen, he would probably make money hand over fist. But in 2001, that infrastructure simply wasn't there. Paul would wind up missing the January 5th date as well and calling into the Stern Show one more time, this time to explain what happened. He would also make one more update to his website. I know many of you have been looking forward to the guillotine amputation of my feet on January 5th. However, these are now the existing conditions. The upside, I have secured a production crew, EMT services, lighting, camera crews, director, live band, the video and DVD production, lighting, location, production manager, and oh yes, the guillotine. The downside. 
Corporate lawyers have caused me to lose several members of the crew, the satellite truck, and the initially interested investors who were covering the production costs of the amputation event. This being the case, the amputation of my feet by guillotine is postponed until the production money for the event has been secured. Many of you wonder why I am not using the sign-up money to pay for the costs. The money paid for memberships is an escrow until after I perform the amputation. So, I am hoping to find an interested investor to help me get this amputation underway. If you are interested in financing the production costs of the event, I would love to talk to you. Please email me at freck at cutoffmyfeet.com. Paul Freck Morgan. Ultimately, this was the last update on Paul's website, and the stream would never happen. Cutoffmyfeet.com would expire later that year, and Paul Morgan would seemingly disappear from the internet entirely. And that seems to be where the story ends now. But if you know what happened to Paul, if he ever cut off his feet, or what happened to him, please let me know. I would love to find out what happened to him and have an update for you guys. When it comes to being naked on the internet, 2010 was actually somewhat of a more innocent time. Snapchat had not yet been released, the term revenge porn hadn't been uttered on every single major media outlet yet, and send nudes had yet to become an actual meme. But that all came crashing down when a man named Hunter Moore created a website known as Is Anyone Up? The site made a major impact, almost immediately spreading both by word of mouth and through social media. Personally, I became aware of it by being a part of the touring metalcore band scene. I specifically remember being on tour, I was in the world we knew at the time. And I woke up in the van one day and everyone's talking about some guy and some other band's dick pics getting leaked online. I think it was Adam from Oceano, but so many dick pics wound up on that site that it could have been just about anybody else. So people are sharing this link all over Facebook and it leads to a site called isanyoneup.com. And then the next day, there's some girl who goes to shows in some other town whose nudes are leaked once again on isanyoneup.com. And then the next day, there's another dude, and then another dude, and another guy in a band. Every single day, it seemed like there was a new person whose nudes wound up on isanyoneup.com. What the fuck was going on? Let's begin with the site's creator, Hunter Moore. From a young age, Hunter had been bitten by the bug of entrepreneurship. He knew that he wanted to build something, but he wasn't quite sure what yet. And then, he would come into a significant amount of money after winning, ironically, a sexual harassment lawsuit against his old employer. That money, however, did not get invested into a startup. Rather, it went into a lifestyle of traveling and partying. By 2010, despite all the money that Hunter had come into, he found himself basically penniless once again. But it was those life experiences that gave him the initial idea for isanyoneup.com, a travel guide filled with the scandalous stories of his experiences. Essentially, Is Anyone Up was originally going to be Tucker Max, but with a tourism angle. And so he purchased the URL isanyoneup.com. He then immediately proceeded to procrastinate, party some more, and make absolutely nothing. According to an interview with the all.com, Is Anyone Up wouldn't find its true purpose until Hunter Moore had a conversation with a friend. One night, while I aming with friends, Moore attempted to send a naked picture of a girl he was sleeping with. When it didn't work, a friend convinced him to upload it to his anyoneup.com, then dormant. He and his friends started adding to the site just for laughs, he said. A B9 forum poster somehow came across the site, and one day Moore checked the traffic and realized the site had gotten 14,000 unique hits the day before. And that's when things started to pick up. And thus, Hunter Moore began to grow his massive online collection of scene girl boobs, band dude dicks, and nargoyles. So this site hits the scene, and at first, people are freaking the fuck out. People are fighting with their exes, people are getting cancelled, uh, you know, before cancelling was America's favorite pastime. You got other people claiming they were hacked, which, alright, sure buddy, you were totally hacked. And you would think that all this might be a devastating blow to the naked picture economy, and in some ways it was. But something interesting and unexpected started to happen. When a person's nudes wound up on isanyoneup.com, although it was kind of embarrassing, 
those people would kind of become king or queen for a day. All of a sudden, you're the talk of the town and all the attention is on you and the site links to your Facebook and your Twitter. Although a lot, probably most people are scared by this kind of thing, you also have some people who crave this sort of attention. So then you have some people who are submitting their own nudes, and sometimes you notice, hey, this band guy's dick pic got leaked suspiciously close to the album release or the tour announcement. People start spreading the site's hashtag NBHNC, no butthole, no care, and they're getting tattoos of it. And although by many accounts at this point, Hunter Moore was the most hated man on the internet, there was also this weird cult of personality that started to develop around him. There were some people who fell in love with his unapologetic persona, the lack of filter, the way he would respond to hate mail. All of a sudden, he's throwing parties, he's DJing events, he's sponsoring tours. Which, by the way, there's definitely an old-ass picture of my butt and everyone else on the tour package's butt from this tour that they sponsored. Uh, maybe I'll throw it up on Instagram or something. And as is anyone up is gaining this momentum based on extreme love and extreme hate, the mainstream media starts to take notice. Now he's getting interviewed by ABC News. He's going on the Anderson Cooper show to be confronted by people who wanted their pictures off his site. And you have a lot of people asking, how could this possibly be legal? And today, it very well wouldn't be. But back then, there were no revenge porn laws, or really even a mainstream concept of what that entailed. It seemed like the best course of action for people who wanted to take him down would be to take him down using copyright laws. And that's just what Facebook attempted to do. Claiming that Hunter Moore had no right to share content from their website, Facebook sent him a cease and desist. Hunter responded by sending the lawyers a picture of his dick. And ultimately, there was very little Facebook was able to actually do about this other than giving Hunter a lifetime ban and blocking links to his Anyone Up. That's because, due to the fact that all of the content on his Anyone Up was allegedly user-submitted, it was subject to the same protections that content on Facebook was. So despite more than a year of constant legal threats, hate, getting stabbed with a pen, it seemed like nobody could take his AnyoneUp.com down. Anyone except for Hunter Moore himself. And that's exactly what happened on April 19th, 2012. It was on that day that Hunter announced that he was turning over a new leaf and he sold the website to Bullyville.com. He claimed this was because he was now educated to the dangers of cyberbullying and he wanted to use his skills for good. He even started a charity organization called We Party for a Cause. And then, a few months later, after being arrested for headbutting a stripper, he announced plans for a brand new website that's just like his AnyoneUp.com but with a couple new features. My name is Hunter Moore and I created his AnyoneUp.com when I was 24 years old. I was broke and sitting on my parents' couch in Sacramento, California with negative $120 in my bank account. It was for me and my friends to post pictures of girls we were fucking at the time, and somehow, someone found it and it became what it was. I sold it because I hated what the media turned it into, and it could never be what I wanted it to be, and always wanted to troll the lame and boring fad that soccer moms love, and that's bullying. We had too many hackers, too much overhead, and way too many legal problems. This time, I am doing it right. We are going to start off by launching with all the old original IAU content and all new content. The submission page has only been up for 5 full days and we've done over 7,000 submission within that time. I am creating something that will question if you will ever want to have kids. I am making something very scary but yet fun. If you remember the old IAU, you will have it back with the mobile app to go along with it and a very strong social networking site of our community. I hope you're all as excited as I am. And it includes people's addresses. One key distinction he makes in comparing the new platform to 4chan, however, is that users will not be anonymous. What I'm trying to do is take anonymous away from the internet, he said. No more anonymous submitting. And Anonymous responded. They began an operation known as Op Hunt Hunter. This operation led to the posting of Hunter Moore's home address as well as his family's personal information. And on top of this, Hunter also lost a $250,000 defamation suit after he accused the owner of Bullyville.com, the site he sold his anyone up to, of being a pedophile. It was clear that Hunter Moore did not mean what he said about changing his ways, so why would he close the site to begin with? One theory claimed that he closed the site after receiving a legal threat from one of the actors of Twilight, 
whose dick pics wound up on the website. Considering how much time he had to spend brushing off legal threats, though, that theory never really held much water. The more likely explanation, as it turned out, was that he was under investigation by the FBI. Do you remember how I said that some people claimed that their naked pictures were hacked and they never sent them to anybody? A lot of people brushed those claims off because frankly it sounds like a likely excuse. But the FBI took those claims a lot more seriously, and in January of 2014, Hunter Moore was arrested by the FBI and indicted on charges of conspiracy, unauthorized access to a protected computer, and aggravated identity theft. And while awaiting trial, Hunter Moore was completely banned from using the internet. And he would wait for that trial for a little over a year until February of 2015. At his trial, Hunter Moore pled guilty to all charges. Upon sentencing, he would be required to spend two and a half years in jail and be required to pay a $500,000 fine. At this point, his AnyoneUp.com was already a distant memory and Hunter Moore's celebrity status highly diminished, but for the people who had been trying to take him down for years, it was a big win. But that's not more where the Hunter Moore story ends, and it appears he is trying to mount some kind of a comeback now. He regained internet access in May of 2017 and began producing music. Upon his release from jail, he also made a YouTube channel and wrote a book about his experiences with HisAnyoneUp.com, which I'll link in the description if you're curious. Although HisAnyoneUp.com only lasted 16 months, it played a pivotal role in shaping the culture and the legality of naked pictures on the internet. Imagine going through all the trouble of having a baby. You wait around 9 long months till it finally pops out and then BOOM! Ugly baby. There's many such cases. And sure, the ladies that want designer babies can just head down to the Burlington Sperm Factory, browse through the catalog, and find their favorite flavor of 6 foot 5, Dolph Lundgren, Diesel, Giga Chad, and have their uterus feast on elite baby batter so that they can pop out the next phase of human evolution. But if you're a guy, you might be thinking that your options for having a non-garbage test tube baby are kinda limited. Well, you'd be wrong. What if I told you that there actually was some mail-order eugenics for the fellas? A man named Ron Harris has you covered with his website where you can browse through images of supermodels and, if you so choose, for a reasonable fee, receive their eggs for you to nut on. I mean, alright, I guess I'm oversimplifying the science a bit. It's not like she's the Little Mermaid. Because the Little Mermaid you would hook up by jizzing on her eggs. Sorry to ruin your fantasy, but she's a fish and that's just how it works. So for today's episode of Tales from the Internet, let's take a look at Ron's Angels. By the time 1999 came around, photographer Ron Harris had seen it all. A storied career of working with some of the most beautiful women around the world. In both still photography and, perhaps most famously, the 80s erotic workout video Aerobicize, which gained popularity with its airings on Showtime and left many Gen Xers with some of their most cherished formative memories. The unfortunate thing about models, though, in the rare case where they're actually getting paid, it's often not enough to make ends meet. They didn't have OnlyFans back in those days. And that's when Ron came up with the brilliant idea. You see, beautiful women have beautiful babies. And these models aren't planning on getting pregnant anytime soon, so why not sell their eggs? Ron sets up an auction website for it takes a cut of the profits and everybody wins. Thus, the website Ron's Angels is born. Welcome to Ron'sAngels.com, the only website that provides you with the unique opportunity to bid on eggs from beautiful, healthy, and intelligent women. That's right, on Ron'sAngels.com, with starting bids ranging between $15,000 and $150,000, you too can bid on your very own supermodel eggs. Each model had a page with a profile including a photo of their statistics such as age, blood type, and height, their parents' ages, race, and why they were doing this. Some of your lovely egg donor options included Model 117, a 25-year-old student who is selling her eggs to afford college and facilitate her acting career. She has a 3.0 grade average and loves animals. Model 88, a 20-year-old Romanian model selling her eggs so she can move to the USA. 
Model number 10, a 29-year-old pop artist selling her eggs to facilitate her career in pop art. Buyer beware though, her breasts are not real. At some point, Ron also expanded the business to include a sperm donor. Model 89, aka Perfect Health Heterosexual Businessman. And if you felt like your goods were up to snuff, you could take a picture, send over some basic information, and apply to be a donor for Ron yourself. It's the kind of thing that sounds like it's probably illegal, but you're kind of not sure, and it's also the early days of the internet, so you're never really sure about anything when it comes to legality. At that time, basically everything is uncharted territory. But just to keep things safe, Ron made sure to indicate in the disclaimer on his website that this was merely a venue for the sale, and not a place where actual medical procedures were being facilitated. You're not just gonna get an envelope full of eggs in the mail from Ron. The site gets a ton of attention really quickly just for being such an absurd, outrageous concept. Over 5 million views in the first week. And then on October 23rd of 1999, a journalist for the New York Times named Carrie Goldberg blows the lid off the whole operation. On web, models auction their eggs to bidders for beautiful children. The topics of high fees for egg donations was already a bit of a hot topic at this time. There had only just recently been a controversy where college newspapers were filled with ads soliciting egg donations for $50,000. In the article, she talks about the disgust this website caused among fertility specialists. Mr. Harris's melding of Darwin-based eugenics, Playboy-style sensibilities, and eBay-type commerce struck some infertility specialists as the most worrying sign yet of where the partly unregulated field of assisted reproduction may be going. Shelley Smith, director of the Egg Donor Program, a center in Los Angeles, said, It's frightening and horrible. And the worst part for me is to think there might be something worse still beyond our imagination. It seems to escalate, and ever since the internet, it seems to snowball more rapidly. The depersonalization of people and selling of eggs. Carrie Goldberg also spoke to Ron Harris himself, who defended his website saying that the criticisms were basically just a case of political correctness run amok. The way he puts it, since all women are not the same, the cost of their eggs should be based on their perceived value. The article continues the discussion with experts based on the ethics of the situation as well as the usual protocol for this sort of thing. They note that typically an egg donor would be selected based on her traits and then paid between $2,500 and $5,000 to cover her time and discomfort. And other doctors noted that when it comes to this, people aren't necessarily guaranteed to get what they're paying for. Intelligent parents aren't necessarily going to have intelligent children. And good-looking parents aren't necessarily going to have good-looking children. Can you imagine paying $150,000 for supermodel babies and then they just pop out on their uggos? Or even worse, can you imagine being the disappointingly ugly baby? Kinda awkward. As more outlets picked up on the story, though, suspicions started to arise that this was a hoax. In part, due to the fact that clicking around on the website would eventually lead you to Ron's porn site. A porn site that included pictures of several of the models that were supposedly selling their eggs. And with that in mind, I can't help but wonder if this was originally conceived as some kind of a fetish thing. A lot of how the site is made reminds me a bit of those cannibal roleplay sites that I came across in the Armin Mivis video. The profiles with all of the statistics of the women and the application process. Perhaps there are people who got off to the idea of selling their eggs to the highest bidder. In any case, people monitoring this website also noticed that none of these bids ever seemed to go up. Although as the site continued to receive negative attention, several of the models asked to be removed from it. So really, what was the deal here? A few people raised the idea that this website was merely a publicity stunt to drive traffic to his actual business, the porn site. And indeed, it turned out that Ron Harris did have a history of trying all different ways to promote his various porn sites. Although it was typically less imaginative stuff like spamming newsgroups until his sites got put into spam blockers, and when you look into the story, pretty much anywhere you look will declare that it is a hoax, but Ron himself never conceded this. To the very end, he maintained that this was a legitimate auction site. And he also said that his experience as a photographer uniquely qualified him for this line of work. What are my credentials, Harris boasts? 
I am a renowned fashion photographer and director for 40 years. And in case you doubted his past experience, he adds, I have been an Arabian horse breeder. He also declared that due to his specialized knowledge on this topic, he had spent the last 20 years working on a book that would detail his theories of genetics. Unfortunately, the book never came out. Two of the models that worked on the site also spoke to reporters and claimed that yes, it was real. One said that she wanted the money for college, and another said that she wanted it so she wouldn't be dependent on men. In response to his website, the American Society for Reproductive Medicine even published a report on the commodification of human egg donations. In the report, the ASRM urges that such high fees should not be paid for eggs as it might cause women to discount the small but real health effects. It also urges against paying more for specific traits, referring to the practice as positive eugenics. So what do I think? Was it a hoax? Kind of. What I think happened is that Ron probably heard about the college newspaper scandal, the one where people were selling eggs for $50,000, and it got the gears turning a little bit. Knowing what a controversy this stirred up, he saw the opportunity for publicity, and it worked. I doubt that any actual sales were made through this website. But that being said, hypothetically, if a serious buyer were to come through this website and attempt to buy these eggs, I think he would have done it. Considering that it wasn't illegal and the plan was always to have the separate medical arrangements made off the website, why the fuck wouldn't he do it? But that being said, I also can't help but think that on some level, Ron was trying to make a point through satire on his website. You look at some of the things he wrote on there and it's just dripping with it. Beauty is its own reward. This is the first society to truly comprehend how important beautiful genes are to our evolution. Just watch television and you will see that we are only interested in looking at beautiful people. From the network anchors, to supermodels that appear in most advertisements, our society is obsessed with youth and beauty. As our society grows older, we inevitably look to youth and beauty. The billion dollar cosmetic industry, including cosmetic surgery, is proof of our obsession with beauty. It is not our intention to suggest that we make a super society of only beautiful people. This site simply mirrors our current society and that beauty usually goes to the highest bidder. And my belief that Ron was engaging in social commentary with this website is furthered by a statement that he made in an interview with an old porn website, 4 In 1981, Ron operated a photo studio in LeBray Boulevard. After taking aerobics classes to stay in shape, he created TV's first aerobics exercise program, Aerobicize. It premiered on Showtime, 7 4 there are all these beautiful girls on a rotating turntable that turned all the boys on. People Magazine called me the King of Jiggle. Is this man trying to turn the country on or get the country in shape? A couple of people called me the father of erotica. I never came to terms with the erotica part. I would not go into pornography. In my head, I am not a pornographer. I'm an artist. I have no doubt in my mind that a man like this a pornographer that fancies himself an artist, might have been attempting to criticize our society's obsession with beauty by taking it to an extreme end, much in the way that Jonathan Swift attempted to criticize the treatment of the poor by suggesting cannibalism. Or maybe it was just the porn site. In the days of dial-up and AOL 3.0, there was no such thing as social media, at least not the way that we know it today. But despite that, people still felt the need to put themselves out there and claim a little piece of the internet for themselves. And the way a lot of people chose to do this was to make a personal homepage on a free service like GeoCities, Fortune City, Zoom, etc. I definitely made a few of these for myself back in the day. I remember I had a really shitty one with a sky background and a, just a, like a list of cool people. That was the whole website, cool people. You just get a picture of yourself, scan, write an awful paragraph, and throw up some terrible MIDI background music, and you're good to go. You got a homepage. And in 1998, halfway across the world in Turkey, a man named Mahir made a homepage of his own. This is my page. Welcome to my homepage. I kiss you. I like music. I have many, many music instruments in my home I can play. I like sports, swimming, basketball, tennis, volleyball, walk. I like sex. I like to make photo camera. 
Animals Town's nice nude models and pipples. My tall 1.84 centimeters, my weight 78 kilograms, my eyes green, I live alone. I have home car. And like the vast majority of these kinds of home pages, my here's was forgotten about almost immediately after it was made. And that home page would remain forgotten for about a year until one day in 1999 my here woke up to find out that he was suddenly the most famous man on the internet. His homepage went viral before going viral was even really a thing. All of a sudden, his face is everywhere. Everybody knows who he is. Articles are being written about him. He's getting phone calls from reporters. He goes so mainstream that even Mad TV makes a parody sketch about him. I will photo your sex! Sex, sex, sex! Mahir had essentially become the first bona fide internet celebrity. At this point in time, my hair is killing it. He's got uh, advertisers throwing money at him at a pre-adsense time when people didn't really know what anything was or wasn't worth. He's got merch. He even made an I Kiss You song. At this point in time, my hair mania was basically running the internet. One year later, in March of 2000, the Ali G Show premieres. That show featured a character that you're probably very, very familiar with. Borat, who very, very clearly resembles Mahir in both appearance and demeanor. Both Mahir and Borat are womanizing Eastern European journalists who enjoy ping pong, wearing speedos, they even share that same catchphrase, I like sex. And Mahir absolutely did notice the similarities, especially after Borat got his own movie that was a huge international success. And it seems like this should be a pretty cut and dry case. There's just no denying that the similarities between Mahir and Borat, who came out a year after him, are undeniable. But the truth is actually a lot more complicated. You see, even though Borat had made his debut in 2000, Sasha Baron Cohen had been performing as a very similar character as far back as 1996. 1996 being two years before Mahir ever made his website, and three years before it became famous. Sasha Baron Cohen debuted the character in 1996 on a show called F2F. The character wasn't called Borat though and he wasn't from Kazakhstan, he was Alexei and he was from Moldova. After F2F was finished, Cohen would bring the character to another show called Comedy Nation. Now the character was an Albanian reporter named Christo. Let's take a look at this footage of the proto-Borat, Christo from Comedy Nation. Diana. Ah, Diana. <laughs> ah. In Albania, we hear she is dead. She is dead. We are sorry. As you can see, the character of Borat is very much present in Christo. But how is that even possible when Mahir is a real person who has characteristics that are basically undistinguishable from a fictional character that came before him? That makes no sense, right? And by all accounts, Sasha Baron Cohen had never ever met Mahir to make this character based off of his real life persona. The whole thing seems like an improbably strange coincidence, but I think I actually have an explanation for what happened here. According to a late 90s website that was committed to digging up internet hoaxes, the Mahir webpage that went viral is not actually the page that Mahir himself made. Someone whose identity is still unknown to this day had discovered Mahir's original homepage and then re-uploaded it with the text that we now know it for. All of the lines that we know Mahir's page for, the I like sex and the taking pictures of naked women, that was all added by this unknown person. If I had to guess, I would say that the person who made this version of Mahir's homepage, the one that actually went viral, they were probably a fan of Comedy Nation, and when they found Mahir's page, they immediately saw the similarities between him and Christo. But that doesn't explain the similarities that are newly introduced to the character after the Mahir webpage happened. So here's what I think. After the Mahir here webpage went viral, there is no possible way that Sasha Baron Cohen wasn't made aware of it. And there's especially no possible way that he wasn't made aware of the similarities between the real life Mahir and his fictional character that he had already been performing. So he sees that and all of a sudden he absorbs the other traits of the character, like the ping pong and the speedo and the I like sex. To put it short, what I think happened is Borat inspired Mahir, which in turn re-inspired Borat. So legally speaking, does Mahir have a case against Sasha Baron Cohen and Borat? It's possible, but I'm not entirely sure. I mean, sure, a lot of the main things that people remember Borat for are things that came from Mahir, like the catchphrases, the speedo, the ping pong, but that doesn't define the entirety of what Borat is. 
The real comedy of Borat came from taking these people who were in otherwise respectable positions and putting them in ridiculous, uncomfortable situations and seeing how far you could push them. It's comedy that, in my opinion, still holds up really well to this very day. This comedy is very clearly not entirely inspired by Mahir, but perhaps the superficial aspects that were taken from him might be enough for him to have a case. A court case was something that Mahir had been pursuing for a while, but now the last time he had actually spoken about it is 2010 in an interview at RaffleCon. I was about to say this, yeah, maybe I must go sue. Well, they, they haven't my permission. They move it. They did move it. My friend, all friends say Borat Solom Mahir, the character. We will come, we go to New York for the lawsuit against 20th century folks in Borat. I haven't heard of this court case ever actually coming to fruition, but if he does want to come to New York to pursue it, I think I can think of a particular dog bite attorney that might be interested. The older I get, the more I forget about what it was like to be a kid. That whole period of time just kind of disappears into this fog with precious few days standing out. Pizza parties, fights, and then there was this one time. I think it was in first or second grade. I got permission from the teacher to go to the bathroom and they give you that wooden pass that every class seemed to have. I walk into the bathroom and I go up to one of those tall, full body length urinals that elementary schools always had. And that's what I made a horrifying discovery. At the bottom of that urinal, mere inches away from my shoes, was a massive turd. A man-sized turd so big that perhaps it was actually left there by a teacher. This completely blew my eight-year-old mind. I had never even considered such a possibility. No person would possibly leave a number two where number one belonged, yet there it was. Whoever that brave soul was, they created a memory that stuck with me for my entire life. They inspired me, taught me to think outside the box. I never did it myself, but I often thought about what it would be like. And years later, I found out that I wasn't alone. It was in late 2000 that a group of proto shit posters, let's call them, got together for a very auspicious conversation on IRC. A number of topics came up that night, including the idea of pooping in a urinal. They all had a good laugh, but in particular, one of them just couldn't get over. He thought about all night long, and eventually he just had to, absolutely had to register the URL urinalpoop.org. And shortly after, he would craft that website into the internet's number one destination for all things urinal poop, such as this Space Moose comic. Hmm? Tee hee hee. Space Moose, what the hell are you doing? What does it look like I'm doing? You... you can't do it in there. Oh, I'm so sorry. I must have missed it when you got your PhD in defecation. Or this comic from the Humor Archives. It's okay, I've got diarrhea. It also collected a number of short stories having to do with urinal poop. I'll regale you with this one entitled... Shitter. One night, before a girls varsity soccer game, some friends and I drove up to the game and had a pre-party in my van before the game. It turns out we were pretty late for the game, so we quickly downed around six beers each. Before making the trek up to the field, we decided to make a piss stop in the school. The closest bathroom to the entrance we went in had two urinals and one toilet. My friend took the toilet, and I took a urinal. My other friend really needed to take a number two, but the toilet was already occupied. So, he proceeded to take a dump in the urinal. After he was done doing that, we were all laughing beyond belief. And the same friend who took a crap in the urinal started to choke on his gum because of how much we were laughing. So, he then flew over to the toilet and threw up all over the place. Needless to say, we all flew out of the bathroom at that point. The next day at soccer practice, the door was propped open to air the sucker out. That poor janitor. In addition, it also linked to a website, urinal.net, which was a gallery of unpooped urinals. In a way, this was a little bit of a precursor to urinalpoop.org, which would eventually have a gallery of its own. But at this early stage, they had no pictures, and the owner was asking for some submissions. 
Send me pictures of poop in urinals, damn it. Yes, really, I have none. If I get any, I will post them on the page. Stop sending me mail asking for poop pictures. And if you're going around pooping in urinals, it's a dangerous world out there. But don't worry, because they weren't sending you out unequipped. This fecal project mayhem gave you instructions on the best way to get poop in a urinal. How to get poop in a urinal. The easiest way is just to drop trow in the men's room and press your hiney up against the urinal and let go. However, I can think of a few reasons you might not want to take this approach. For instance, there's the whole getting caught ordeal. Or having a colon prone to stage fright. Not to mention, putting your ass into close proximity with thousands of generations of urine. With that in mind, I have devised the following not-so-clever and oh-so-easy plan. In the comfort of your own home, when you feel the urge, crap into a plastic bag. Ziploc would be a good idea. Hmm, sponsor post? When the opportunity presents itself, carefully deposit your offering into the porcelain altar of liquid excrement. Congratulations! You now have poop in a urinal. Take a picture and send it here. And in the unfortunate situation that you did get caught, they had some suggestions on how to get out of trouble. The top X things to say when you've been caught pooping in the urinal. Can you get me some toilet paper? This one seems to be out. I keep slipping off these little seats. What the? Get the fuck out of my stall. I'm installing the new cakes. Didn't you hear about the guy at Starbucks who got his dick crushed in a toilet seat? Dude. I'm not gonna sit on the crapper seats. People piss all over those things. Ideally, these are supposed to be funny. And with his masterpiece finished, the creator of urinalpoop.org shared the link in a few IRC chats and walked away. In his mind, leaving it to be yet another buried treasure in the vast plains of the internet. Like the icy hot stuntas, or Jeff Goldblum is watching you poop. But then, Something unexpected happened. About a month after urinalpoop.org went live, its creator noticed a sudden surge of traffic. Out of nowhere, tens of thousands of people were looking at this website. So he went and checked his logs and noticed that all of this traffic had been coming from none other than Goatsy.cx. Yes, that Goatsy.cx. Urinalpoop.org had apparently been posted alongside the world's most famous gaping butthole. And it was shortly after that that he received his first submission for his gallery. And now here's the thing, I don't know if I would get a strike for posting the uncensored picture. There's not even anybody that I could talk to at YouTube to find out because that, that's how the system works. But I'm not going to chance it, so here's what I'm going to do. I'll be censoring the turds with the closest approximation that I can think of, and you could just be comfortable knowing that these pictures existed. Behold, the one and only entry in the very first incarnation of the urinalpoop.org gallery. But although the site's popularity was growing exponentially, it would actually lie dormant until mid-2002. According to the site's owner, it was a thread on the Something Awful forums that reminded him of just how funny it is to poop in a urinal. So he came back to his old creation and gave it a total redesign complete with a brand new logo. And thus, we entered the golden age of urinal poop. The gallery had grown, and the site now had a philosophy section which covered the three aspects of pooping in urinals. Rationale. Most of us have, at one point or another in our lives, seen a urinal. As objects, in and of themselves, they don't elicit much in the way of commentary. However, when combined with fecal matter, the urinal instantly becomes a veritable tinderbox of wonderment, derision, offense, and general unpleasantry. What would drive someone to do such a thing? Desperation? Showmanship? Desire to disrupt? General drunkenness? Indeed, the juxtaposition of these two otherwise ordinary objects is more than the sum of its parts. Thus, urinalpoop.org. Delivery. And this section was a restating of the original strategies for getting poop into a urinal, divided into two sections, brute force and covert strike. And finally, apology. Be aware that there is a darker side to urinal pooping. After the initial discovery and exclamations, thoughts inevitably turned to wondering who's going to clean it up. 
This section is dedicated to those brave and unfortunate souls upon whom the duty falls to extricate the poop from the urinal. Even for one such as myself, childishly fascinated by the phenomenon, the task is an odious one. I'm afraid I cannot offer much more than words of sympathy and an encouragement to try to look at the funny side of the situation. You'll look back on this memory and laugh. Someday. At this point, the book of urinalpoop.org had become fleshed out enough that it could practically be its own religion. However, one cannot live on urinal poop alone, and inspiration is fleeting. Although the creator of the site, regaining his motivation from somethingawful.com thread, toiled late into the night, working hard, like a Grimm's fairy tale elf making a fine pair of shoes, this would be the last time that he'd ever update it. Years went by, and at some point between late 2005 and early 2006, ownership of the URL urinalpoop.org lapsed and it was replaced by one of those weird placeholder sites. It now proudly sported the text, urinalpoop.org. What you need, when you need it. But perhaps the time had already passed for these kinds of websites. By 2005, we were already deep into Web 2.0, and RateMyPoo.com was providing a more elegant solution for this market. But in a way, urinalpoop.org was a site that kind of bridged the gap between the old world and the new world. I guess what I'm saying is this episode has basically been my no country for old men. There comes a time in every young boy's life when he gets to an age where he needs a little more personal space. He needs his mother to back off a little and give him some room to breathe. Well, I mean, most boys. Sometimes these mothers do give them the space they need. Other times they do everything they can to keep them as little boys forever. And how effective their chosen approach was or wasn't will be reflected in their future therapy bills. Well, one mother from the Netherlands came up with a way to cope with her son growing up that worked for both of them. My son doesn't want to cuddle anymore, so I knit a cuddly version of him. Yes, she made a replica of her son made completely out of yarn. And if you've been watching my channel for a while, I know the question that already popped into your head. Are there real human bones inside of it? The answer? Technically, yes, but not in the way you think. So for this episode of Tales from the Internet, let's take a look at the lady who reinvented her son out of yarn. When morning, not too long ago, I woke up to see that my phone was getting blown up with messages and people tagging me on Twitter. They were showing me this post and telling me that I had to do a video about it. So I take a look and this is what I see. No, this is not a picture of someone that's been horribly burned. This right here is a boy made of yarn. It was attached to a Facebook post that had been screenshotted and was making the rounds all over the place. A mom whose son is growing too old for cuddles has come up with a unique solution. When her son stopped wanting to cuddle, she knitted a life-sized version of him. Now, she can cuddle his yarn doppelganger as much as she likes. Now she wants to help other moms. She says, We thought it would be a great idea for mothers with too much love for their children and need to cuddle. So, they could knit their own cuddly pillow son. This was like a cross between that Sally Acorn doll that I had the old video on, and those people that have those fake babies that they treat like real babies. Except, you know, even kinda weirder because it's based on a real person, her son. It stands to reason that her young son still lives at home, right? Can you imagine you come home from school, you go sit down at the dinner table, and sitting right across from you staring in the eye is you, but made out of yarn. All because you're not giving your mother the attention she wants. It's like some kind of inverted Norman Bates situation. And despite the oddness of the facial features, it does seem to be really well constructed. I mean, look at the articulation in his hands as he eats his fries. The fries that are also made out of yarn. Tell me this, if a boy is made out of yarn, and he eats french fries that are also made out of yarn, does that make him a cannibal? Or is it like he exists as a part of this yarn dimension where every molecule is a piece of yarn? I'm just trying to get the yarn boy lore situated. There he is, picking his nose, digging for boogers that I can only imagine are made of green yarn. Riding his skateboard in his punk's not dead sweater. No apostrophe, implying that there exists multiple punks just walking around like GLaDOS. They're still alive. And this yarn construction is sturdy enough that it can hold a skateboard in his arm. And here he is with a real boy for scale. As soon as I saw these pictures and that post, I knew that there had to be more to this story. 
It begins on Instagram. The creator of the Yarn Boy, Mary Key Vorsluis, began posting the photos of her creation on Instagram on January 11th, 2016, to a wide variety of reactions. Some thought it was kind of creepy, some thought it was cute, others were simply marveling at the immense skill it had to have taken to make. So to explain this further, she writes an article that she submits to BoardPanda.com. My son doesn't want to cuddle anymore, so I knit a cuddly version of him. It was from this post, based primarily on this headline, that this yarn creation would go viral and blow up all over the internet. Obviously, that explanation combined with those pictures is gonna lead to some crazy stories in people's heads. Like, when you put it that way, it legitimately sounds like something out of a horror movie. But when you start to read the post, it actually makes a lot more sense. She begins by explaining that the inspiration for this piece came through her work. I am a professional knitter who likes to knit cool things for my brand, Club Galook. We knit realistic everyday stuff with lots of details and even wrote a couple books about it. We knit hams, TVs, plants, all sorts of funny and unique design things. Let's take a look at some of these items. Club Galook. We have things like a yarn lobster on a plate, a yarn cake, a yarn plate of spaghetti with shrimp. The level of detail on this is actually really impressive. Like, I had no idea you could do this kind of stuff with yarn. Look at super elaborate paintings made out of yarn. Like, she took these and almost made it like a kind of pixel art. A yarn Jesus? Why do girls love Jesus? Because he's hung like this. Each been kinky? The fuck is a good hand job? I mean, I know what a good hand job is, but I mean, what is the section a good hand job? And I can't show you what's here, but it's a lot of very highly detailed penises made out of yarn in various shapes, sizes, and colors. Many of them mounted on a wooden plaque, like I'm gonna put up a picture of that, that bass you hang up on the wall and it sings, except instead of the bass, picture a giant yarn cock. You know, the sea bass thing, it has a little voice box in it that makes it work. You could probably get one of the yarn cocks and put the voice box in the cock so that it's a singing mounted cock on the wall. There you go, free idea for a how-to channel. A yarn condom? I would not recommend using that. That's for display purposes only. There's also a whole bunch of yarn porn, like this cigar box where a naked guy- it look, This is what it looks like. A naked guy is squatting over another naked guy, and I think he's peeing or about to pee on the other guy's face. It's a little vague, it's like a 16-bit game where the pixelation leaves a bit to your imagination. So clearly, this is an extremely talented person that's making whole-ass sculptures and paintings out of yarn. Really pushing this medium in ways that I had never even considered. And as she puts it in her blog post, making the yarn boy was actually a challenge that she made for herself to improve her knitting skills. Not only that, but despite the implication that she made the yarn boy because her son was growing distant, he actually liked the idea and worked on it with her. And after seeing such mixed reactions from people they knew in real life, they decided to do the photo shoot. She goes into more detail in the blog post. It was a fun family art project. When it was finished, we thought it would be a great idea for mothers with too much love for their children and need to cuddle. So they could knit their own cuddly pillow son. My knitted son consists of a knitted head with a cap, hands with nails and watch, knitted trousers, a knitted sweater with an obstinate slogan, knitted sneakers, and knitted iPod. As for what's inside, well, actually, the knitting pattern is characteristics of both my sons. The other one had just grown so much during the process that the smaller one was only able to wear it when it was finished. So yeah, the reason why the yarn boy seems disturbingly realistic and seems to move in a very lifelike way isn't that there's a fully carved bone skeleton inside of it like Princess Sally. Rather, the skeleton inside belongs to her son, and the skeleton's still in him, because he's in the costume. Even with that explanation though, some people were still creeped out. Lady, that's a little strange. Maybe you should talk to a shrink. What the heck? Why would someone do this to their child? What if their friends come over and see the thing sitting there string at you? What are you supposed to do? Be like, oh, dude, that's super, uh, that's super cool, I guess. And the people saying to stop judging her, I did read the article, and it's still weird to me. Just saying. Man, even Jared from Subway didn't do this. 
Although eventually the comments did fill with more people who were on her side. Good lord, you people are stupid. It's a joke. It's just for fun. It's creepy. The story largely went viral in other outlets and on social media without the context that A, it's just a costume, and B, not only is it her son wearing it, but he helped make it. This led to people thinking there's this creepy Dutch mom out there who replaced her son with some kind of yarn zombie. And some people, after finding this out and being weirded out by it, went and read the full story, and then they got even more weird about it with a lot of people seemingly running with this narrative that she forced her sons to do it. This is fucking sick and weird. Your kids turn out demented because some of you have coping issues you need to get sorted before having them. FYI, it's not a stuffed yarn replica. She makes her other sons wear the yarn version of her eldest son to cuddle. I have to share it with more info. She makes a younger son pretend to be the older son in a yarn suit to cuddle the older son. Do y'all see the problem here? I don't know, maybe I'm the weird one here, but looking at the full context, I just don't think there's anything that wrong with this. It's a kid working on an art project with his mom, with every indication pointing to the fact that he wanted to do this. And I can't help but think that a lot of people who are like, oh, this is creepy and she has problems and whatnot are probably the same people that go around like, oh, the kids, the kids be on their phones. They're playing too much Fortnite. So, you know, let them do a family art project. In any case, with the narrative having gone wildly out of her hands, Mary Key would eventually talk to Huffington Post's weird news department. They would write an article called, Woman who knitted life-size version of her son says you don't get the joke. She really doesn't want to cuddle with it. In the article, she expresses her thoughts now after this whole thing went viral. Thing is, although this seems pretty straightforward, according to Vorsluis, she meant it as a sarcastic joke. If I knew so many people thought this was really about getting more cuddles by a lovesick mother by knitting my son, I would have posted something different, Vorsluis says. Somehow, I can't help but think that she knew that the original title, My Son Doesn't Want to Cuddle Anymore So I Knit a Cuddly Version of Him, paired with such striking, bizarre photos, was a recipe to go viral. But I guess she made the mistake of assuming that people would actually read the article she wrote and understand it. That's just not something you can take for granted online. I mean, realistically, there's probably people who just saw the thumbnail for this video, or they just watched the first minute of this video. And now they're telling all their friends, oh my god, this creepy lady made a Princess Sally bone skeleton out of her son. She made a bone skeleton boy out of real bones, and now I gotta tell everybody. But it's the kind of thing where no matter what information you put out on it, some people are just gonna think it's weird, while other people are going to appreciate it for its artistic value. And on that note, while occasionally still making appearances on her Instagram, it has also been shown at the Freeze Museum in the Netherlands. So although a lot of people online didn't get the joke, I guess people in the legitimate art world did. But anyway, that's the story of the boy made out of yarn. There is a massive elephant in the room on my channel. I mean, I've covered all the greats on here. Goatsy, Jarman, Two Girls, One Cup, the BME Pain Olympics. You know, all the classics. But there's one that eludes me. One that, whenever I'm interviewed and asked about if there's a video I've tried to do but it just never comes together, it's this one. That being, Lemon Party. It's one of the classic shock sites of all time. And there is a bit of lore for me to go over, but I feel like with all of the classic shock site videos that I have on this channel, we always wind up digging up something a little extra about the origins of it. You know, like where it really came from, who these people were. And while there is a lot of interesting stuff about this for me to talk about, I've never been fully satisfied with what I'm getting for a Lemon Party video. That being said, there is quite a bit that we do know that might surprise you and perhaps some ways that we can finally get to the bottom of this. So for today's episode, let's talk about Lemon Party, what we know about it, and what we can do about it. Here's it, fellas, my white whale of shock sight lore, Lemon Party. For those of you who don't know what Lemon Party is, and surprisingly from people I've talked to in real life about my plans for this video, a lot of people actually don't know what Lemon Party is. So for those of you, here's what it is. Much in the tradition of bait and switch websites like GoatC, you send off a link to your butt on AOL Instant Messenger to LemonParty.org. Sees the message, pauses his game of Eternal Darkness, puts down his Pepsi Blue, and goes, hey, Lemon Party. Bet that's like Hamster Dance or something. He clicks on it and this ain't no hamster dance. You got 
three naked old men kissing each other and sucking each other's dicks. And it's all set to If You Want to Be Happy by Jimmy Soul, which in itself will become a meme later on again on YTMND. So you see this happening, you're like, oh no, you got me. And this is 2002, so like, this is like the golden age of making fun of your bros for gay stuff. The perfect meme for this period in time. And sure enough, getting to be like, hi, you're gay, bro. And having your bro be like, oh no, bro, you made me gay, bro. In the early 2000s, I had enough gas to make it kind of a mainstream sensation, which wasn't terribly common at the time. You got radio shows, comedy shows, talk shows, all talk about, you know, at least three men blowing each other. At this point in time, a common vector for people getting sent to Lemon Party was dressing it up as if it were a political ad of some sort. You know, people with pictures of signs, sick of gas prices, lemonparty.org. And it's a good angle, because, you know, like, Lemon Party, that sounds like it could be the name of a political party or something. And the thing is, it actually was a political party. In fact, the real Lemon Party predates the website by decades. In 1987, the Lemon Party of Canada, or Parti Citron, was formed in Canada by Denis R. Patineau, who is a figurehead, of course, for their true leader, Pope Terence I, who may or may not have actually existed. Probably didn't, though. Using the slogan, For a Bitter Canada, their goal was to shift Canada's economy to focus on lemons. They wanted to make Canada the lemon capital of the world. But there's a bit of a problem. You see, lemon trees, they usually need a bit of a warmer climate. And as you might know, Canada can get kind of cold. You know, lemon trees, they thrive in places like Southern California, Mexico, India. But the Lemon Party had a plan. Rather than fight global warming, they would actively encourage global warming until Canada became the prime spot to grow lemon trees. <laughs> They also wanted to abolish Toronto, repeal the law of gravity, and merge the Great Lakes. Obviously not an actual serious political party, more of a work of satire, but nevertheless, they were registered. Furman Supreme would be proud. And although the Lemon Party was only actually officially registered until the early 90s, they did have somewhat of a presence until at least the mid-2000s. With press releases as recent as 2006, at which time Post Terence rose from the dead to continue his mission of a bitter Canada. What this means is the original Lemon Party did have somewhat of an overlap in time frame with LemonParty.org, which of course makes you probably ask the question, did this Lemon Party, the satirical political party, have something to do with LemonParty.org? And it's not really clear. They have never officially claimed it, but LemonParty.org was in fact registered in Canada. And this could be the type of wacky stunt a joke political party might pull. At the same time, though, they did have a real website, LemonParty.VZE.com, which, although not updated since 2006, was actually still online surprisingly recently. LemonParty.org itself has been sold and changed hands a number of times, usually keeping the original source material, but now with added porn ads. And actually, while well, checking up on it a few months ago, and I'm glad I took screenshots then because it's gone now, it was redirecting to a strange chat room about seemingly nothing in particular. But the real meat of this story to me, what's the deal with the actual picture? Who are these men? What is their connection to the website? Was this from a photo shoot? Or something that was surreptitiously caught on camera at a swingers party or something? My gut tells me that whoever made this website simply went to Lycos or Hotbot or something and looked up gay old man born and found the most striking image they could use. But it's always felt like there just needed to be something more of this. I've always had a theory that there were several images that existed of the Lemon Party, just sitting around on some random website waiting to be found. And I know it's pretty weird to be curious about different angles of old man dicks from decades gone by, but at this point, it's such a part of history, part of our culture, it would almost be a kind of a earth-shattering revelation to uncover the rest of the Lemon Party. I even took to AI to try and figure this out. So there's this thing I use sometimes, it's called PimEyes. It's actually kind of creepy, because it's an AI facial search engine. It's the kind of thing that it seems like something that would be useful in my line of work, however, it's never actually yielded me something I can use. This case being no exception. So I put the Lemon Party image into the AI search engine. Of the three men, it could only identify one of their faces as a face. The one Japanese looking dude. Most of what turns up is just other sites hosting the same Lemon Party image. Sometimes as a collection of classic memes, others as a collection of various pictures of naked old men. And then you go down to the low quality search results, and you just get a bunch of guys who vaguely resemble the guy. I'm not going to share their faces, because I mean, it would be kind of fucked up to be like, look at these guys, they look like the Lemon Party guys. Not them, but just look at them. 
but the guys, they definitely look like the guy, but they're mostly definitely too young to be him. And that's kind of like where the trail stops for me. Every time I look into this story, it's just, you meet this dead end, and I figured it was finally time. One reality that we may have to face, though, you know, the Goatsy Man was one of the world's most prolific asshole spreaders in history. The Jar Man turned out to have a prolific history of shoving all kinds of things up his ass as well as other orifices. The director of Two Girls, One Cup was basically the Leonardo da Vinci of shit porn. But maybe the guys from Lemon Party were just a bunch of guys. The only thing I could think is maybe of the million something people subscribed to this channel, somebody just happens to know something. Essentially, this video is half shock site lore, half lost media. The most mysterious old man dicks on the internet. But yeah, if you have further knowledge about the Lemon Party, let me know. Whenever a new medium pops up, there's pretty much just one guarantee. People are gonna try to use it to hook up. Think back to newspaper personal ads. Or those weird old VHS dating videos. Hey, how's it going? They call me the Hispanic Dragon, cause uh, typically by the end of the night I'll be dragging these nuts across your face. My friends call me Wavy, but the ladies, they call me the Silk Master, cause in the bedroom I'm as smooth as it gets. You could tell me about your family, and I could tell you about my mother. Uh, things she used to say to me, things she used to wear, things she used to make me wear, things that she wore that I would like you to wear. And the internet, forget about it. It's kind of funny to think about how nowadays we basically have Tinder on our phones and kind of just think of it like a vaginal Grubhub. And everyone's just kind of cool with it, but it used to be a lot weirder. Even weirder. Just a couple fellas doing what a couple fellas gotta do. Alright, not that weird. Well, let's take it all the way back to 1998, before dating sites were really a thing. A time when one pioneer of the early internet decided to take things into his own hands. Hello, my future girlfriend. This is what I sound like. Did he ever find a girlfriend? Let's find out. If you've ever played a Vectrex, or if your kids have a Vectrex, I, uh, I was responsible for that. I've often made reference to how in the old Web 1.0 days, the Tripod, Angel Fire, GeoCities days, you know, the days before Andy Milanakis invented memes. Browsing the internet was kind of like being on a raft in a vast ocean bouncing between a bunch of weird little islands. And one of the most common purposes of these islands was to serve as sort of a personal profile page. Basically serving the purpose of social media before social media was really a thing. And there is one king who took this a step further. He made a website with a purpose. To find a girlfriend. Hello My Future Girlfriend was made on Tripod in 1998, featuring a picture of a little kid with a fantastic mullet, and text that read, If you have come here, it must be because you meet me in Yahoo Chat. Let's take a second and talk about what a ballsy move that is. I mean, you're in Yahoo chat chatting up all these girls, and when they want to know more about you, it's like you're like, hey, no words, just look at my website. It's kind of like going to a bar and just giving a girl your business card. I just lost my girlfriend. If you want to be my girlfriend, please email me or ICQ me. My email is kidblount at yahoo.com. My ICQ number is 19171502. My name is Michael. This is me. If you have Microsoft Internet Explorer, you will hear me in the background. If you have Netscape, click here. If you are going to be my girlfriend, please don't dump me after I like you. And while most people in those days would have a PHAT fat MIDI playing in the background, Kid Blount played this audio file of his voice. Hello, my future girlfriend. This is what I sound like. I am 11 years old, in the 6th grade, in New Mexico. Please PM me if I'm on Yahoo Chat. Bye! And this website would only briefly stay between Kid Blount and the countless girls he would seduce in Yahoo Chat. It very quickly started to make the rounds in IRC chats and get passed around emails before it made its way onto a website, HowFreshIsThisGuy.com, where he was featured as one of the fresh guys. But the hero of our story wouldn't fully be propelled into the mainstream of the internet until 2001. That was when he found himself on the TV shows The Screensavers and Unscrewed with Martin Sargent. 
and later on that year, he would be posted to the front page of Newgrounds.com by its creator, Tom Fulp. Over the years, Newgrounds has always been timely with pointing out slash making fun of viral trends on the internet. We were right there at the onset of Mahir, what's up, and all your base. So now the question, is this going to be the next big thing? Is everyone going to be emailing this link to all their friends? Respond to this post with your thoughts, or just go ahead and create a Flash cartoon making fun of this poor kid. Either way, I can't wait to hear your thoughts. And the community very quickly came out to roast this kid. Greg Mundo, I hate this kid. He's been hit by the ugly log, and he sounds like a woman. Jesus, if he thinks the internet will get him laid, he has another thing coming. Mork, that kid was hit by a whole ugly lumber yard. Damn, he is a bugger looser than me. Dado the mofo. Ha 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 ha. Oh, I am sorry. It is just impossible not to laugh at this little guy's voice as soon as you hear it. This is what I sound like. Whoop de doo. Hearing your voice make me want to punch your little rat face even more. I don't care how old the sight is. That was just too great. Adding to my gavarits. Hey. It'll help me laugh when I'm feeling down. However, a lot of members also point out that this site format at this point 2001 was already getting kind of tired and played out. It wasn't that different from Mahir or a lot of other weird guy personal pages that have been popular the past few years. And another user, Blast Zorak, made reference to Super Greg, who also had a page in this format that had making the rounds around the same time. But Tom Fulp saw things a little differently. But Super Greg is fake. Super Greg and several other oddball characters were made up by some PR firm who wanted to impress people by their ability to create a viral buzz. The problem is, they followed the Mahir formula exactly. Any dumbass knows that in order to be viral, it has to be different. I hate Hollywood. This kid is similar to Mahir, but different, and amusing enough to get my attention. The plea for a girlfriend is also not an original concept, but coming from an 11-year-old kid with a mullet, I get a big kick out of it. Ultimately, although by the time Tom Fulp shared this website, the format was a little bit played out and the site itself had been shared around for a few years, countless memes and Newgrounds videos wound up being made about it and helped spread its popularity even further. And ultimately, Hello My Future Girlfriend would wind up being one of the most popular memes of this format, continually re-emerging year after year. But that still leaves us with the million dollar question. Who is this kid, and did he ever find a girlfriend? Fortunately, for the sake of this mystery, the kid who made the website, identified as Mike Blount, would make a few more attempts over the next few years to reclaim his internet fame. The first attempt would come in 2004 when he opened up a new website called Deceitful.org. On this website, he posted brand new pictures of himself alongside the mullet picture, and unfortunately, I haven't been able to find the exact pictures that he used on that website. They haven't been archived to my knowledge, but if you happen to have them for some reason, it is an important piece of internet history, I think. He also wrote up a lengthy history of everything that happened to him after his website went viral. He begins by telling how the webpage came to be made. I created the Hello My Future Girlfriend webpage during the summer before 6th grade. I was 11. During this time, my elementary school friends were getting girlfriends. It was all completely innocent at the time. That was back in 1998. I lied about my age so I could register a tripod account. I had recently taken a beginner HTML class for kids at the local college. The class lasted at most two days. The instructor requested that each student bring two pictures for him to scan so he could put them on our web pages. I brought the picture of me and then a landscape picture my mother took while in Colorado on vacation. The class was very interesting to me at the time. One of the last HTML tags I learned in the class was the embed tag. I had not met a girl in grade school that would bear the burden of being called my girlfriend, so in an act of desperation, I created the webpage. I planned to meet a nice girl in Yahoo chat and then give her the webpage address and hope for the best. As many of you have seen the webpage mirrored somewhere, the email address has been changed. My original email address was kidblount at hotmail.com. Only after the web page was mirrored did this change to KidBlount at Yahoo.com or something else. He then goes on to describe the rise in popularity a few years after he had made the site. 
In 2000, I received my first email from someone who had seen the webpage. It was very negative and quite surprising. I just shrugged it off and thought that it was just the one person that saw the page. The next day, my Hotmail inbox was flooded. I bet I received at least 50 messages. Some were positive and some were negative. At the time, I was only 13 years old. The positive emails were encouraging and the negative emails had a depressing effect. It seemed for every one positive email, there were three negative ones. Soon the phone calls started. Middle of the night, people would call and ask if I had a girlfriend. I had not told my parents about the webpage, and I really didn't want them to know. Well, eventually I had to tell them. They couldn't believe I had done it. Well, neither could I. So, I tried to get into my tripod account and delete the webpage. However, I had forgotten the password, so there was nothing I could do. Later, I found out that my simple webpage had been mirrored all over the internet. During this time, a person by the name of Magoo contacted me. He wanted to interview me for his website, www.chimp.ca. I reluctantly agreed and had a couple ICQ conversations with him. He was encouraging. I lied to him about having a girlfriend. I told him I had found a girlfriend in hopes that the late night calls would stop. This was a lie. Eventually, I came clean. One of the girls that had emailed me was in high school and very attractive from her photo. I had released the chat conversations I had with her to Magoo. He in turn posted her picture on his website along with the chat. Later, the girl in the photo contacted him and she requested her picture be removed from the site. It turns out a middle-aged man was posing as her. I soon changed all my information, no longer giving out even my first name. For a period of about six months, I believe I didn't even use the computer. I wish that this whole thing would at least stay out of my school. I don't think I could have endured being made fun of in school for this. I wanted it all to just go away, so I stopped all contact with the online world. The phone calls also seemed to stop. I was happy because I honestly believed that it all stopped. Slowly, I came back to the online world. I used to even enjoy watching the screensavers on tech TV. That all changed in January 2001. An old friend called me out of the blue and asked if I made a webpage looking for a girlfriend. Shocked, I explained to my friend that I had. He then told me that he was watching the screensavers and it featured my site. I asked my friend to not tell anyone. I went to the screensavers website to see what had happened. I then read how Martin Sargent had made fun of the site. As a result of this incident, I have not watched the screensavers since. Later, I discovered that most of my friends had seen this episode of the screensavers, but had not made the connection that it was me. In May 2003, after completing the computer science final, the class was given free time on the computers. A friend that sat right next to me went to Razoric.com to look at their animations. I glanced over at my friend's computer and see that he is watching the No Luck Mikey animation. I hope that my friend would not make the connection that I am the same Mikey whose picture was in the animation. Somehow, my friend overlooked that I was Mikey. He laughed at the animation. And things took a really scary turn when he discovered that he had been completely doxxed. Recently, I had not heard anything about the site, and I believed that it had finally died out. Currently, I am a junior in high school. In November, the high school's computer technician called me into her office and told me she had received an email from someone looking for me. The email was from... Link removed. He claimed he was an old friend and wanted to interview me. I told the computer technician that I had never heard of this Aaron, so at my request she deleted the email. I immediately went to, link removed, to see what the site was about. There I found mention of my old webpage. About a week later the school secretary asked to speak to me. Aaron had posted on the high school alumni bulletin board that he was looking for me. He claimed he was an old friend. Once more, at my request, the message was deleted. A few weeks went by and I thought that the people at Link Removed would get bored and stop in their search for me. I was wrong. On December 18th, 2003, I received an email from an Eric MM13. It was a simple message. 
He said that he was a longtime fan since the early days, and he asked how things were and if I got a girl. This was quite a surprise. I wondered how he could have gotten my email address. I did a Google search and found that he was a member of the Bait Shop forums. On the Bait Shop forums, I discovered that there has been an active forum about me since at least April of 2003. One of the latest posts was titled Michael Blount Information. The post linked back to Link Removed. The page was entitled Michael Blount Findings. It listed my parents' names, home address, home phone number, school address, latest accomplishments, as well as my mother's occupation and her hobbies. I found out that my email address had been posted with my name on one of the pages at the Adventures in Supercomputing site, sponsored by Lanel. I quickly changed the address to a different one in hopes that the sanctity of my current email address might be preserved. And he had also learned of Newground's interest in him. Later, I discovered the large collection of Flash animations at Newgrounds. I was shocked to find out the number of Flash animations on Newgrounds that involved me. I actually found a couple of the animations humorous, others I found pretty lame. It has taken me a while to go from the webpage being the bane of my existence to actually accepting it. Now, even I can go back and laugh. Ultimately, the new website that he made would be very short-lived because he had a falling out with the person who designed it for him. Damned people. Okay, because I don't have time to redo this site right now, this is gonna be up until this is redone. The site you see now was done by Matt. I do not recommend using him as a site developer because he can be a pain in the ass to work with. Okay, with that said, if anyone feels like helping me with the new website, contact me through the contact on the side. For the most part, after this falling out, Mike would be more or less quiet on the internet until 2010 when he came back to make a Reddit AMA. Although most of what he had to say in the thread was already covered in his 2004 website, there were a few new tidbits, such as a newer collection of animations that Tom Fulpit curated. Hello my future girlfriend. Those words will forever be stuck in my head, along with I kiss you and what's up. Two other catchphrases that have become prominent on the web. Mikey is a poor, lonely boy with a mullet. His girlfriend dumped him, and he has turned to the web to find a new love. I hadn't realized that this site was actually two years old when I posted about it on the front page. It was still new to most people, and the response was insane. We instantly had a slew of Mikey parodies on the portal. Luckily, this was not drawn out quite as bad as some of the other trends on NG. We got a few really funny cartoons, and some that are just beating a dead horse. You can sort them out below. He also revealed that he had made another short-lived website back in 2008, and this one was mostly just a blog that collected his daily thoughts. But perhaps the biggest revelation in this AMA was the answer to the burning question. Did Mikey ever find a girlfriend? Yes, I am gay. I like the cock. I have never had a relationship with a woman was recently broken up with again, so my third long-term relationship ended mainly because I did not work out, which I'd like to and will start doing soon. And with this revelation, he would take to YouTube to create a fitting bookend to this story. A sequel to Hello, My Future Girlfriend. Hello, my future boyfriend. This is me, 22, still live in New Mexico. I'm online a lot, so you should I am me. Bye. Thanks for stopping by. As of now, it seems like this is where the story ends, but perhaps someday we'll get another update as to whether or not he ever found a boyfriend. Eminem, Macklemore, Vanilla Ice. The images of many icons line the walls of the White Rapper Hall of Fame. Yet there's one legendary act that's conspicuous by their absence. Three rap gods who came from the mean streets of Tacoa, Georgia and brought us such classics as Get Crunk, Haters, and True Pimpin'. I'm talking about Freeze, Blade, The Flame. This is the story of the Icy Hot Stunters. The 
Icing at Stunters were one of the greatest memes of 2001, and I was really surprised that when I was talking about making this video, a lot of people told me that they did not remember them. That's something that I gotta fix right now. The Icy Hot Stunters website, which was created sometime around April of 2001, begins by inviting you to click on the rap star you want to drool about. We've got the Blade. Don't get cut by the Blade. Yeah, 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 you know this. Blade, the leader of the group and quite possibly the most dangerous person you have ever met. Two years in state pen for armed robbery, four years in rehab, still on the yayo, and who knows what's next for this type of food. The Flame, your punk ass is gonna get burned by the Flame. Thought yeah wasn't a sucker? Flame, the fastest rapper on four wheels. This guy spends his time blowing away fools in his pimped out firebird. Just kick out them Brembos. Stop yourself on a dime. In his past, Flame has done time for outrunning the 5-0 and cutting some punk sucker up and freeze. His bio wasn't linked correctly and it goes to a page where they're talking about their cars, but look at him, he's blue. It's like if the Planeteers were white rappers. And the Icy Hot Stuntas let us know that they came here with one mission. Aw shit, yo punk ass has just come to the hardest, fattest, and tightest group the world has ever seen. I see hot stunters in the 2G plus 1. We ain't like your backdoor boys, your N-Sucks, or your Britney Smears, and if yo think we is like yo puff mommy, yo snoof puff, or yo dumb ex, you is crazy wrong. We are taking the hip-hop scene to a whole new level, only rolling in the fattest damn cars where it is on dubs, cutting tracks that smash the charts and shit, and making sure we have enough ice to make you go blind. If you came to our fat site to play a hate, then get the hell out. We ain't needing you. Sucka! Now, the story of the Icy Hot Stunters gets really confusing very quickly. So confusing, in fact, that it kinda made me change the way I keep my research on these videos, probably making the channel moving forward better for having covered the Icy Hot Stunters. When covering these kinds of old websites, I've mentioned a lot that something that would happen really commonly was as soon as one of these websites went viral, people would make a bunch of parody sites of it. And I don't think I've ever seen as many parody sites pop up as they did for the Icy Hot Stunters. Most of the parody sites just kinda mock the Icy Hot Stunters by talking the way that they talk, essentially making them indistinguishable from the genuine website. And one of them seemed to have been made by someone they might have known in real life with a bit of a personal grudge, who had pictures of them not as the Icy Hot Stunters. Of what's been archived, we have one of the stunners in a pretty preppy outfit holding a tennis racket, and it calls him a poser because he plays tennis. Also, this being 2001, pretty much all of the parody sites just called them gay. I see hot stunters fighting for gay rights everywhere. You might think, wow, that's fighting for gay rights everywhere, that's very kind of them. Surprisingly woke for a bunch of gangster rappers who've been in and out of prison so many times, right? But you gotta remember, once again, this is 2001, so rest assured that this is them getting on. One of the better made parodies start off by mostly just imitating the original page and keeping a blog with update posts that gradually get more and more ridiculous. We see the Icy Hot Stunters upload their pictures on HotOrNot.com. The Blade tries to donate blood, but it gets rejected because he has the West Nile virus. And then they tried to join the army after 9-11. This page was actually maintained for a few years, and at the end, the person running it would eventually try to promote his own music which was actually something that was pretty common with these sites as well. And what was also common was the release of a few music videos pretending to be the Icy Hot Stunters both as parodies and both as people trying to use the attention to get themselves some notoriety. And that being said, I think it's very, very possible, probably likely, that the original Icy Hot Stunters site, the one that went viral, being shared through emails and sites like Something Awful and Fark.com, there's a strong chance that that one itself was a parody that had nothing to do with the Icy Hot Stunters. Just looking at the bios and all the writing on the original, original website, it seems likely to me that that one was making fun of another website that might have been more legitimate that this guy saw and was quickly deleted or just never got any kind of attention. And there were some people who thought that maybe the Icy Hot Stunters were a deliberate satire made by the guys on the site 
basically an online Malibu's Most Wanted before Malibu's Most Wanted. Either way, the Icy Hot Stuntist would eventually actually release some music, which takes us to mp3.com. And now, mp3.com itself isn't very well archived, so some of what I'm about to say is going off of memory, and I might be wrong. But I recall the very early days of mp3.com being a very basic barebones site with just a list of songs you could download. Eventually they had a lawsuit that made them take all that stuff down and kind of rebrand as a more legitimate site and that more legitimate site is somewhat archived. And once they went in that more legitimate direction it became a pretty big destination to discover new music. I remember finding out about a lot of different bands on there, and I even remember doing stuff like streaming a concert where Slipknot opened for Cold Chamber on my shitty 56k modem. And as time went on, it became more and more of a destination not just to find, you know, bigger acts like that, but also for independent artists to showcase their music. The Icy Hot Stunt is page on mp3.com does not appear to have been archived in any way, but going by the context clues, it appears that there were nine songs in total. Of those nine tracks, only two have been preserved. Get Crunk? And of course, True Pimpin. And even listening to the songs, it's still kind of difficult to tell if this was done as a satire or if it was made as an earnest attempt to make good music. But the more I looked into this story, the more convinced I became that this group was 100% a legitimate effort. So let's take a look at where the Icy Hot Stunters wound up after 2001. Very little could be found out about what happened to their leader, Blade. As for Freeze, allegedly he made a homestead webpage of his own, and on this page, he talked shit about the other Icy Hot Stunters. The earliest remaining archive of this webpage is from November of 2005, and unfortunately, it's a dead link. All that remains of Freeze's webpage is a quote in an article from Next Impulse Sports. I did some research, practiced my rhymes, and came up with some of the fattest beats the world ever saw. But the Flame and Blade weren't having none of it. They says I wasn't taking it serious, and so on. Bastards told me that I was no good, worst thing they ever seen. But they used my songs and got a crappy replacement. Now you see how big they are? Shizzle my nizzle, these guys got huge off my work. And now it's time for you all to know the truth. Spread the word, y'all. Now, due to all the fakery around the Icy Hot Stuntas, and due to the fact that this sounds like a guy making fun of how white rappers talk, common sense dictates that this website was probably not actually made by Freeze. But that being said, the story that's being told here is actually corroborated by something I found later. And that being said, let's talk about The Flame. Or as he is now known, B-Shock. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to show you the Jesus lean. Yeah. <laughs> See, I know y'all like to dance. So we about to do the Jesus lean. Like this. Left, left, left. Judging by this color scheme, I'm assuming Jesus is a crip. Look, look at this girl, she can't keep together, she's absolutely losing her shit. This kid's all out of sync. How do, you, how do you mess up the Jesus lean? You just slightly tilt in a direction. But at least he's having a better time than these two. You got that right. The Flame is now known as B-Shock, and he's spreading the word of Christ through the power of rap. And if we look at the bio on his website, it speaks of his beginnings. Pursuing music from the young age of 16 and getting sucked up into this wild partying lifestyle that completely consumed him and left him depressed. He decided that he needed to make a change and that's when he chose to rap about God. And I could have ended the video here, it's a pretty shocking revelation that this guy just became a Christian rapper, but something about that conclusion it felt like there's still a missing piece of the puzzle. There's a big gap between the Icy Hot Stuntas and B-Shock. Whenever I would look up anything about this story, it would just be told as, okay, so 
2001, you have the Icy Hot Stunters, and then all of a sudden now you got B-Shock, Christian Rapper, used to be The Flame. But there's, there's such, like, a wide gap there that surely there had to be something in the middle. And then I found that something. You see, the current version of B-Shock's website makes absolutely no reference to the Icy Hot Stunters. But if you go to the Internet Archive, that piece of the puzzle emerges in 2003. B-Shock was B-Shock, but the project wasn't just B-Shock. It was B-Shock and the Dirty South Basement Boys. AKA, the Icy Hot Stunters rebranded. And this version of the bio contains a little bit more information about what actually happened. So for the first time in 17 years, I present to you the story of the Icy Hot Stunters as told by The Flame. B-Shock has grown up in the small town of Toccoa, Georgia, now labeled by him, T.O.C. He began having dreams of being on stage rocking crowds in elementary school. He would find himself writing songs on paper and hiding them under his bed, getting them out to sing every so often. It wasn't until the early years of high school that he had finally decided that rap was the genre for him. He discovered a kid in his school owned a small homemade studio. After begging this guy for three months, he finally provided B-Shock with some simple rap beats. B-Shock spent a few weeks with these beats and wrote a few songs. He appeared at this homemade studio one night and rapped away. This turned into making a six song CD with two of his friends. He obtained some local fame with an open concert held in a car garage. After selling many CDs right there in town, a few guys started hating and attempted to torch the group by spreading thousands of degrading websites of them around the world. This corroborates my theory that at least one of the websites was made by someone who knew them in real life and had a personal vendetta. It also means that perhaps there never actually was a real official Icy Hot Stuntas website. It's possible that they were just put online by that one guy with a vendetta and then every single parody website was people making fun of that fake website. Even though it was bad publicity, it was publicity. B-Shock said this was simply motivation for him. This is when his heart set on fire. The group decided to change their names from whom they had previously been known. This is when B-Shock became B-Shock. His mother gave him the name. He took out loans and forked out thousands of dollars to purchase his own studio. Immediately, he went to work. Mastering the beat machine, mastering the studio mechanics, and most of all, mastering his voice on the microphone. He named his studio DSB, Dirty South Basement Productions. After making The B-Shock Show, a solo CD strictly for practice, one of the guys in his previous group told him that he wanted to stay in the game and was dedicated and down for whatever. He goes by the name Lil Rel. I'm assuming Lil Rel was Blade and that website that was supposed to be by Freeze really was by Freeze or was made by someone who was aware of the situation. B-Shock then picked up C. Rainey and the girl Bash. These four members formed B-Shock and the Dirty South Basement Boys. Most of them attending school in different locations would call each other at night, rapping the new verses they had wrote that day, dying for the weekend to come so they could meet in the studio and lay it down. The group came out with the hot CD, Mean Streets. Everybody was talking about it. Everybody was getting it. Everybody was bumping it everywhere they went. Interestingly, according to an old post on Fark.com, the album Mean Streets was actually uploaded to the Icy Hot Stunt's mp3.com page. Meaning that essentially, this album, along with the one on the website Shockology Headbobbin 101, are lost Icy Hot Stunt's albums. Currently, B-Shock is also on tennis scholarship at his school, with many tennis accomplishments in the past such as being ranked number three in the state of Georgia. What? A rapper that plays tennis? That sounds twisted. But not since B-Shock's music has hit the streets. As for now, B-Shock is aiming for the top with his new blazing album, Shockology. He puts all of his faith and trust in G.O.D., asking him for the best. B-Shock prays that he will be a good influence for the rest of the world forever. And then if you want, you can find out how do I become Christian and go to heaven. Can you imagine finding God through the icy hot stuntas?
So it seems like the truth is, not only were the Icy Hot Stunters real, but they never went away. This discovery is the evolutionary link between the Icy Hot Stunters and B-Shock, who still continues to make an abundance of music to this very day, and who even now maintains his YouTube channel, where he's been vlogging about his experiences in the studio during the pandemic. And although maybe he wanted to bury his connection to the Icy Hot Stunters, I think it's cool that one of the internet's earliest memes still lives on to this very day. All I do is wait. Wait.